Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. A gentleman named Frank Richard Stockton, whose name may not be familiar to you, as I must admit it wasn't to me, wrote one of the most famous short stories of all time. It was called The Lady or the Tiger. I mention it only because, in its own curious way, it reminded me of the story that Dr. Felix Brandt is about to reveal. What impulse drives me to put what follows on paper, I don't exactly know. I suppose it's a need for confession, or perhaps a prayer for forgiveness to a God I've forgotten and, and whose mercy I do not deserve when I die, which will be shortly. And I wonder when they close my eyes at last if I shall meet the soul of Hugh Prentice, and if I too will be condemned to wander eternally in a vast limbo of loneliness as punishment for my crime. A crime worse than murder, for which I do not have the courage. But I was determined that death was too easy for someone who had violated the one person I had held most dear in all my life. So I dared play God out of my own special knowledge and exact a punishment to fit the crime. Whoever reads this, make your own judgment. What has been done cannot be undone. Our mystery drama, The Doppelganger, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Howard Da Silva. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. To go back to The Lady and the Tiger... You'll remember, I'm sure, that it was a story of a man who faced two doors. Behind one of them was a famished, raging, man-eating tiger who would devour and destroy. Behind the other was a love goddess 
every man's desire. Now, I'm not suggesting that this story has anything to do with that story, except in the matter of choice. Something we do every day. Select one alternative or the other. So, let's examine Dr. Felix Brandt's selection and judge him as you may. My name is Felix Brand. I have a doctorate in clinical psychology. I was married, have one daughter. As I've grown older, although it has been a passionate obsession of mine all my life, I've had to fight the tendency to devote more time to my avocation than my vocation. Parapsychology. The exploration of the psychic, the world beyond the finite world. A hobby, or obsession if you will, which led to my unspeakable crime. Worse, far worse than murder. It was nice of you to meet me at the airport, Dr. Brandt. For reasons deeper than simple courtesy, Hank, I wanted to have a private chat with you about the woman we both love, that daughter of mine. That's why I'm letting you drive, so I can... Well, w what is it? Is there something, something about Fran? No, not just at this moment. Quickly, Hank. Cut over to the right lane, fast. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, but what... My God. Do doctor, if, if you had told me to pull over, that maniac would have hit his head on. There's nothing more we can do, Hank. The police have it in hand. Let's drive on. Yes, sir. The man is dead. I don't know. Probably. He is dead. Well, how do you know? I don't. I only sense it. He didn't want to live. I don't know why. Heart condition, terminal disease, some reason. Well, how, how could you know what kind... Well, how did you know to tell me to pull over so suddenly? As if you knew in advance there was going to be an accident. I'm an old man, Hank. An old man who meddles perhaps in too many things outside my province. I've been looking deeper and deeper into parapsychology, and some of the things I've come to believe in rub off. What things, sir? Oh, extrasensory perception, ESP, if you'd rather. Clairvoyance, telepathy, all sorts of psychic phenomena. I'm thinking of abandoning classic psychology and switching over to the other side. Matter of fact, I'm already teaching one course in it. And that's of little interest to a lawyer. Or even my prospective son-in-law. <laughs> Tell me, what brought you flying down from law school for the weekend? Well, didn't Fran, uh... Or hasn't Fran said anything to you, Doc? About what? I don't know, just, uh... Well, her letters have been very strange lately, and... Not very frequent. I thought something might be wrong. I, I mean, I had a hunch. <laughs> the amateur outflanks the expert. I hope you're wrong. You you have me worried. Frat is everything in the world to me. If anything ever happened to her... She means as much to me, Dr. Brandt. Now, don't you worry. If anything is wrong between us, we can set it right. It was a relief to have Hank back again. I had been worried about my daughter Fran lately. Fran, the picture of her mother, whom I lost too soon. Bright, open, happy, reaching out both hands to the world, full of love to give and expecting the same in return. And yet I knew, had been trying to conceal from myself something that was very wrong, something it took Hank, whom she had loved with all her heart since high school, to bring out into the open. Hey, Fran. What you trying to do? Get pneumonia? Oh. Hi, Hank. I didn't think you'd be here so soon. I'm, I'm warm enough. Mm -hmm. Huddled out here in the gazebo with snow all around and the wind whistling up icicles. I've got my pocket to keep me warm. How about your love? Uh... Don't I get a welcome kiss, even if it's a cold one? Oh, Hank. Oh, Hank, what am I going to say to you? Well, 
Something a lot more straight from the shoulder than those weaseling letters I've been getting recently. I know. I'm not very proud of myself at the moment, Hank. Hey, you don't have to cut corners with me. There's another guy, right? Hank, please listen to me and, and, and try to understand. You see, Dad has been teaching his regular survey course in basic psychology, and um, I met this, this this guy there, and I don't know, I've, something crazy happened, something I wasn't prepared for or even thought about in my well-ordered life. You fell in love with him? Yes. Which lets me out. Hmm? Please don't put it like that, Hank. It's just... It's something so sudden, so overwhelming. I, I don't Hey, even... don't I even get a chance to get up to bat for the ninth inning? It's too late, Hank. I'm going to have his baby. Ooh. Well, that's... That's right between the eyes. When's the wedding? I don't know. I just found out. About me, I mean. I could cheerfully wring that rabbit's neck. Did your, your father know? Not yet. And this guy? I haven't even told him yet. Why not? Well, I... I, I, I just haven't had the chance. I... Okay. So it shouldn't be a total loss, and I don't waste the whole trip down here. <laughs> we'll make a deal. I'll tell the doc about it, and you pin down your, your dream boy. Uh, what's his name, by the way? I won't tell you that. I, I'm afraid to. I... I do love you, Hank. Why did something else like this turn up? Friend. I'm no oracle. It's just what happens to people. Sort of thing that shakes faith and makes you wonder about God. But it's life. It's what we have to live. Come on, let's... Let's both go inside before we freeze to death. I can't believe what you're telling me, Hank. Well, you'd better, Pop. It's true. Pop. No, I'm sorry about that. Just slipped out. That's what I always wanted from Fran and you. And we can't legislate or play God. It's not the way it's going to be. But who's the man? Well, that's Fran's secret. And it's her right to keep it that way. There's nothing either of us can do about it. I wouldn't agree with that. You'll give her up so easily? I never owned her. She's her own mistress. But you won't fight for her? Doc, have a heart. What can I do? I can't force her to love and accept me. The best I can do is be a good loser. <laughs> You gotta be kidding, Fran. So we were together a few times. You ought to know better than to get caught. That's all I mean to you? Oh, don't knock it. Look, you're a sweet chick. We we made great music. It was all for kicks, though. I mean, no ties, no padlocks. Look, don't get me wrong. I'll get you a right guy. I mean, it's all legal now. And I'll bear the freight. You... You, you want me to get rid of the baby? <laughs> well, what else? I mean, you want it, you have it. Just don't try to pin me down. I want to stay loose. That's my thing. I can't believe what you're saying. It's a whole new world. You want to live by old-fashioned boxes they shoved us in. That's your option. You can't push me in a sleeve, so don't ever try. I am today, baby. you got to take me as you find me. Or as I lose you. Well, that's the way it runs. Easy come, easy go. I was that easy. Oh, come on. I didn't say that. Oh, you don't say much you really mean. So? Maybe it's best we just split. No, you please, please. Look, the kid is out. And don't try to hang it on me. I'll deny it. All you'll get is a nice story that will get your old man fired out of the university. Oh, I can't understand myself how I could... How I can be in love with anyone as rotten as you. Oh, knock it off, Fran. If you... Look, if, if if I did do something about the baby, would you still... All right, hey, hey. Now, that's, uh, that's more like my old woman talking. Sure, if you do. I mean, you and me are a thing again. I... I don't know if Dad would... I mean, I... I don't have any money. Yeah, well, don't look at me. I ain't got the bread. But I got something better. What? Got a buddy. Mid-student. 
seen you. And he owes me plenty. I mean, we'll do a little collecting from him. But, but he's not a doctor. He's the next thing to it. Well, don't get the whammies. He's done it before. It's a breeze. Leave it to me. I'll set the whole thing up. <laughs> What is it? Daddy. Oh, the baby, Daddy. It's gone, but I'm... Oh, oh, I'm bleeding. Oh, good oh. Lord. Doc, Doc, anything I can do? Yes, thank you. Call Dr. Montrose and get him here fast. The number's in my address book by the phone on my study desk. I'm on my way. Help me. Oh, who did this to you, friend? Friend of... The man who made you pregnant. Oh. What's his name? Oh, I can't. I, I won't... Well, this isn't the time. But one way or another, I'll get it, friend. And when I do, I'll find a way to make him suffer for what he's done to you. There isn't much excuse for the man whose name Dr. Felix Brandt still doesn't know. Hugh Prentice. The sad thing about life is they usually get away with things. Being without a conscience makes life a lot easier... But is anyone really without a conscience? That's something Hugh Prentice is about to have to start exploring as a strange and eerie punishment creeps over him. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. in the Gilbert and Sullivan tradition, the Mikado's object of making the punishment fit the crime was comic and lighthearted. Here, it is deathly serious. In point of fact, unearthly so. Dr. Montrose was able to bring the hemorrhage under control after he arrived, and once it had stopped and Fran was under sedation, he met with his old friend Felix in the study. Well, she's all right now, Felix. Nothing to worry about. You don't think we should get her to the hospital? Yeah, under ordinary circumstances, perhaps, but uh, I'd say she's out of danger. She'll have to be watched closely, but I can handle that. Uh, if I put her in a hospital, it's all out in the open. Uh, you, you don't want that, do you? What do you mean, Jim? This is a pretty hidebound community, Felix. You're a good friend, Jim. Well, of yours... And little Fran. I don't want to see her hurt any... Why did she do it? I don't know. I mean, she and Hank are going to get married anyway, so it why... It wasn't Hank's baby. Oh. What would you do about the man who started all this, Jim? If it were my daughter? Yes. I don't know. We're, uh... <laughs> we're a little elderly for physical retribution, aren't we? Hmm. And any other course in... Problematical, probably hurt Fran more than the man. It, do you know who he is? No. Fran won't tell me. Uh, I suppose the best thing to do is let it go. Come in. How are you feeling today, Fran? I'm all right, Daddy. I know. I mean, Dr. Monroe has given you a clean bill of health. Has he? Well, he says you can get up and go back to college or whatever you want. Whatever I want. There's one thing I want I may never have any more. Didn't Dr. Jim tell you? Yes. We can talk about it later. Friend... I was just wondering... What? Would you like to... Well, I mean, Hank is still here and he would like to see you. No. I don't want to see Hank. I'm going back where I belong. If he'll have me. Are you ready to tell me his name yet? No. Not till I find out where I stand. How can you make yourself so cheap? This man, whoever he is has taken all the love and the joy and, and laughter out of you. How, how can you go crawling back to him? Because he's the only one who can give it back to me. 
And if he doesn't? Then I... I just don't want to live. I was helpless to aid her, to ease anything for her. All that burned in me was a rage for the man who had turned my happy child into a hurt and battered shell. A beggar dependent on a man who was not worthy of her. And at this moment, even though I still didn't know his name, I could curse him and wish him disaster. I could do better than that if I turned my back on a God that I felt had forsaken me and mine. And as an extension of all my psychic research, turned to black magic and called down a curse on the man who had ruined my child. But first I had to talk to Hank. I love Fran, and, and I want her. I, I always will, but just for her sake, I wish I could break it up somehow, get her away from this this slimy crud that's... It's as though he has her under some kind of spell. We both know he'll hurt her again, desert her, humble her. I think Fran herself knows it, but somehow she can't help herself. What are you going to do, Doctor? Just let her go back to him, leave it alone? I can't stop Fran any more than you can, Hank. She's not a child, she's of age. Her life is in her own hands. I have no legal control. If we only knew who he was. Well, that won't be too hard to find out. I've thought of all kinds of things. Even though I'm not very rich, I could perhaps buy him off. I'm sure he has a price. But that wouldn't solve anything for Fran. She loves him. He's what she wants. He has only the crookest finger and she'll crawl to him. That's obvious enough after all she's gone through for him. So what can we do? You... Nothing. Go back and live your life. Uh, not quite. Without Fran. Well, maybe it won't have to be without Fran. First, we have to clean this man out of her mind and her blood. But you just said we couldn't. One way. If he doesn't exist anymore, if he's dead. Wait a minute. You, you can't seriously mean... Oh, don't that... worry, son. Even if I had the means, a gun, a knife, a blunt weapon, I would have neither the strength nor the courage to use them to say nothing of my lack of know-how... No, but I can wish him dead, or worse, I might just have the power for that. Doctor, are, are you, are you all right? <laughs> I, I don't understand you. Of course you don't understand, and I am quite all right. This is something you will have to leave to me. <laughs> to anyone who reads this, it might seem fantastic. But the rites I prepared are solemn and real to more people around you than you might believe. The ceremonies of dark magic are very real to those who perform them. In the attic, I had found among Fran's childhood dolls, one in the image of a man. I turned my study into a chapel of the damned, burning sulfur and asafetida. Then I recited from my book of ceremonial magic. Oh, all ye ministers and companions, I direct, conjure, constrain, and command you to fulfill my bequest willingly and straight away to accomplish the destruction of this man, unnamed, who has beset my daughter and most grievously harmed her by whatever means best suited. It's, uh, it's great to be swinging with you again, baby. Oh, I, I wasn't sure you'd want me back. I look so... <laughs> I don't know. Ah, you look great, Ken. My old woman again. I'm sorry we got to ride the subway, but who's got bread for the hacks these days? Oh, I don't mind where I am. Just so long as it's with you. Yeah, stick with me, baby. You'll ride first class all the way. I like these types. Look at them. Long gone. You and me are special. Just waiting for the right break. The chosen, huh? If you choose me. I'll buy you all the way down the line, Ken. Take a look. I mean, who is there who could walk into... What is it, you? Yeah, half, halfway down the car there. Look. You see that guy? Oh, which one? You're nuts. What do you mean, which one? How could you miss him? He's a carbon copy of me. 
He's even wearing the same jeans, the embroidered jacket. I, no, I don't see anyone who... Come on, come on, come on. Let's, let's go. i got to catch up with him. Shoot, take it easy. I don't see anyone like you said. He disappeared. He's gone, but he, uh... He's like... He's like my double. Come on, let's go upstairs. Oh, I, I've got to get home, Hugh. Look, this won't take a moment. Yeah, yeah, there, there he is, there he is. He's right at the top of the stairs, next to that fat dame. No, there's no one there. She's all alone. Are oh, you, are you? <sighs> He's gone. He's gone again. But he was looking right at me. Who the devil do you suppose he was? What did he want? <laughs> You. Shh. Listen. I gotta see you right away. I need help. What's wrong? I, I can't talk on the phone. Meet me on the campus. By the fountain. Something real crazy happened last night. I don't know who else to ask uh, what to do. I was just turning in. I was reaching for the light to douse it when all of a sudden he was sitting right there in the chair facing me. Who? Him. The double. The guy we saw in the subway. I said, how the hell did you get in here? Who are you? I am your double ganger. My what? Your double, or if you want, your inheritor. What does that mean? It's time for you to wander like me. It's time for me to return and die as I should have. I, I don't know what you're talking about. A long time ago, so long you can't even begin to imagine, I sinned. And because of my sin, I was not allowed to die in peace, but condemned to wander in infinity until I found a body I could be laid to rest in. My time is almost here, and in you, I will find a home again. I don't know what kind of a nut you are, Jack, but I'm going to kick your tail out of here so I can get some sleep. That won't be necessary. Sleep for you is all I'm waiting for. Huh? When you are safely asleep, you are at my mercy. The moment your eyes close, your body will be mine, and your soul be left to wander through the ages alone, waiting endlessly for peace and the blessing of eternal sleep. Get out! Get away from me! You're nothing but a... Nothing but a what, Hugh? Uh, he's a ghost. I mean, uh, I, I could see him, plain as I see you, but I could see through him, too, like a lamp in back of him, shining through his head. See, the pattern of a chair he was sitting in is as clear as a, a bell through him. I mean, he wasn't real. See, so I, I threw on some clothes. I ran out of the house. I spent the night walking. I was afraid to go to sleep, to bed. Fran, but nothing like this ever happened. Even on the wildest trip, I, I never blew so wild as this. What am I going to do? You? I think you should see my father. Yeah. Oh, sure. That, that'd be great after everything. I'd be lucky if he didn't try to have me arrested. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know you were the one. Yeah, but what could he do? He's a psychologist. He could help you. Look, you were in one of his lecture courses... All you have to do is go up to him and say you have a problem. He'd help you. Now, now the whole thing is crazy. I see some character on a subway in threads like me. I have a crazy dream. Right away, I blow my cool. There's nothing the matter with me. Now, come on, let's let's cut out. I, I ain't even going to see you home. I, I'm going back to bed and, and, and catch some shut Oh, you listen to me. Don't look at me that way. Don't you turn against me. Do you think I could after all that's happened? Yeah. Right, you, you I could count on. Yeah. You're my woman no matter what I do to you. Right? I love you, Hugh. And don't ever forget it, baby. Now, come on, blow. I gotta, I gotta hit the sack. All right, back, back up, man. I got a knife. Get lost. No. You are the lost one. What are you talking? Who is it? Your double canker just waiting for you to get tired enough till your sleep is deep enough. 
For what? To take over your body so that with it, I may bring myself to the peace of the grave. What is this wraith that dogs Hughes path? A figment of a diseased imagination? A figure of retribution created by a conscience weighted with guilt? Or is it some ghastly nemesis conjured from the supernatural, the world outside our comprehension, summoned up by Dr. Felix Brandt through the agency of the devil? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. That night, Hugh Prentice fled to his apartment as though the hounds of hell were at his heels. Locked in securely, with every light blazing, riding high on Benzedrine to keep awake, he paced the two small rooms like a caged tiger. And everywhere he turned, he faced the doppelganger, watching him silently, waiting patiently, a twisted smile of anticipated triumph on his face. At last, he could stand it no longer and fled the apartment with the first light of morning, roaming the streets, afraid to turn his head, knowing his double still followed on his heels. At last, exhausted, he found a small restaurant open and sat there drinking coffee after coffee and watching the clock till nine o'clock came. Then he crossed to the public phone to make a call. Dr. Brandt speaking. Dr. Brandt, uh, this is, uh, this is Hugh Prentice. Uh, I'm a student of yours in a lecture series. It's a large class. I don't place you for the moment. Well, that doesn't matter. What does matter is, uh, look, uh, Doc, I'm, I'm in trouble. Can you help me? Help you? How? I can't, not over the phone. It's, uh, it's like a, it's like a matter of life and death. Help me. Well, if you put it that way, of course. I'll try, Mr. Prentice, was it? Yeah. Prentice. Hugh Prentice. Very well. How soon can you be here? Well, within ten minutes. Very well. I'll be waiting. I hung up with the strangest feeling. My comprehensive basic psychology course has a large attendance. Some 100. The name meant nothing to me. No, that isn't right. I, I didn't recognize it, but what I did recognize was a, a stifling feeling rising in my gorge of implacable hatred for this Hugh Prentice. Why? The name filled me with revulsion. What connection could... And then suddenly... Oh, the pain struck again, sharper than ever. Oh, now... Where, where did... Come. Morning, Felix. I just dropped by to... Uh, what is it? The, the, the pain? Yes. Uh, where are your morphine tablets? Drawer. Forgot this morning. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh. I'll do better than that. Why must you be yeah. so pig-headed? Don't want to establish the habit. Yeah, the habit will hurt you less than the pain uh. right now. To, uh, here, let, let get one, get one arm out of the coat there. Uh, it's better. Uh, can you roll back your sleeve while, while I prepare the syringe? Yes. Hurry. Just let me let me swab first. There. Oh. Now, now hold steady. Hold oh. steady. Ah. Uh, so this will take hold in a minute. Oh, they're, they're getting worse, Jim. And more frequent. Well, I'm sorry. I can't help any more than I can. The only treatment medicine has to offer you, Felix, is palliative. I know. I also know I haven't got much longer. That's what worries me so about Fran and that guy, whoever he is. I don't want him to wreck the rest of her life. Oh, that'll be one of my students. Wants to see me about something. I have to run anyway. I, I just wanted to tell you some good news. I got the tests back on Fran and I was maybe a little hasty on my first diagnosis. With care, there's no reason she can't have a child again. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, as long as that skunk is still alive, whoever he is. I'll let your visitor in. Oh, I, I was looking yeah, for... Yeah, Dr. Brandt, you, you have the right office. I was only visiting. Shut the door and come in. You're Mr. Prentice? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir, that's right. Hugh Prentice. 
Sit down. Oh. Suppose you tell me what's troubling you. Have you ever had any delusions like this before? <laughs> Not on your life. Have you done anything recently that you're that you're sorry for, ashamed of? No. Like what? I don't know. That's why I asked. No. Why should I be ashamed of anything I do? I'm, I mean, like I free wheeled, you know? I give what I get. That's that's all evens with me. What does that mean? Like it's a tough world, Doc. I mean, uh, they're all against me, like most of them. They? Who are they? You know, people. Are your mother and father still alive? No. My old man took off before I was five. And my ma, well, she horsed around like, uh... Well, like she had to live, make the bread for me, like anyone, I guess. Uh, she liked a good time. What kind of a job did she have? <laughs> Are you kidding? Winging home uncles for me. <laughs> I must have had a hundred or so uncles by the time I was 14. And then... Then what? Ah, uh, then she left me with an aunt. Some old dried-up stick. Uh, I shouldn't kick about her at that. When she died, she left me enough dough to go to college like now, and, uh... Hey, hey, look, what has this got to do with that, uh... That, that goon who's tracking me? I'm trying to get around to that. You don't like women very much, do you, Hugh? I don't know what you're getting at. You like to punish them because of what your mother did to you. Isn't that it? Look, I don't have to have you push me around like them. I mean, all I came here for was to ask for help. And I'm trying to give it to you. Well, can you just get this haunt, whatever the hell it is, off my back? I want to try, if you'll just help me. Look, anything, Doc, anything. I, 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 I got to get some sleep, and uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid to. You're quite safe here. What's that thing? It's a metronome. Some people use it to learn to keep time to music. I use it to calm people down. Now, just keep your eye on the needle as it swings back and forth. And try to relax. And answer my questions as honestly as you can. And maybe, together, we can get to the root of what's wrong with you. Tell me your name again. You... Hugh what? Hugh Prentice. Where were you born? Allentown, Pennsylvania. What was your father's name? Frank. And your mother's? Mary. I use hypnosis a lot in my work, but never more deliberately, and I'm ashamed to say, callously than today. Because suddenly, from some deep recess of my being, an electric wave was sending its knowledge to my brain. A second sight was born, and I was suddenly sure who Hugh Prentice really was. Can you hear me, Hugh? Yes. You know a girl named Fran Brand, don't you? Sure. She's my chick. You know she's my daughter? Yeah. And you made her pregnant? She was careless. You took her to someone to get rid of the child? Sure. It's the way it is. No sweat. Don't you know she loves you? Man, like their buses. Another one any minute. Yeah, sure. That's how chicks are. Do you love her? What's with all this love, Jive? I ain't tying myself down no way. It's like I told you, I free wheel. Nobody gonna cut down my style. Keep trying. All the squares, all of them, but I'll show them. Anyone ties me down, I stomp on them good. Especially chicks like my mother. 
All sweet words and cut your throat the first chance they get. Only me, I'm too smart. I cut them down to size first. Don't you worry about old Hugh. The morphine was wearing off already. I sat back in my chair watching the boy whose secrets I had bared. A schizophrenic, classic, already paranoid. Possibly he could be saved through analysis, chemotherapy, new treatments which are being reached every day. Treatments I would never live to see. Treatments he would never willingly seek as he had sought me. Because out of the dark side of my studies and my learning, I had raised a doppelganger. Then for a moment, the pain hit me so wildly, so acutely, agonizingly, that I must have blacked out a moment because... Don't bring him out of his hypnosis. He doesn't deserve to live. I cannot condemn him to the death in limbo like you live. Let me tell you something, old man. You are about to die. Two doors face you. Open one. And you let the scourge out to destroy your daughter as well as himself. Open the other. And I take his body, and your daughter has her chance to live her life. Her chance to find happiness instead of despair and degradation. Which will it be? Which will you choose? Choose. 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 Only in sleep can a doppelganger take possession of another body. Looking at the boy frozen in deep hypnosis across my desk, around him, was it my own pain? A shadowy figure hovered. I knew I could banish the shadow if I willed. But I had chosen my door. I rose and left the office to go home to my study. days after he smashed into the rock wall at Highgate Turn, popularly known as Satan's Trap in our neighborhood. What soul possessed it? I will know very soon. I am about to die and leave this manuscript transcribed through those two days in exquisite pain for my daughter and Hank to read. I know it will bring them their own pain. But I hope it will bring them peace. And if I am condemned, too, for my sins, to wander as a doppelganger, I can only pray that what I have done may be worth it and will have brought my daughter happiness. This manuscript was read by Hank as executor of the estate. And in that position... He exercised a humane decision, perhaps beyond his powers. He did not let Fran read her father's letter. He buried it in a safe deposit vault until the time was ripe, long after they were married and had children of their own. I'll be back shortly. story came to me through accidental channels, long after the principles were gone. I cannot vouch for the truth of it any more than I suppose any of the principles involved could. It's a story, I suppose, of retribution, and at the same time, a frightening lesson to all of us who stretch the human relationship beyond normal demands. If we sin deep enough, in some form, in some way, I suppose there is a doppelganger who will vie with us for retribution. The only way to avoid that is to deny him the chance. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Rosemary Rice, Tony Roberts, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. He can get out and kill somebody else? 
But I don't think he will. You don't think? You're willing to take a chance because you don't think he will? Well, what else can I go on but my own judgment? How do you know he won't kill somebody? I don't. Any more than I know I won't. Or you won't. Or anybody else won't. <laughs> Except possibly your mother, and I can't give you any guarantee about her if it comes to that. Now, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like... You've done a terrible thing. I, I, I don't think so. And you're going to regret it. I, I hope not. Well, you will. You'll see. When you're responsible for another murder, you're going to be very, very sorry for what you've done. Jack, Jack, please. If he kills somebody else, you'll be the murderer yourself. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice and Anheuser Busch Incorporated Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I've been telling you about how I use Magic Mind Mental Performance shot with my morning routine. It's kind of like motivation in a bottle for me. Well, the other day I forgot to take it, but I remembered around lunchtime. This accident turned out to be beneficial because I found that Magic Mind helps me even more if I wait until around lunchtime to take it. I work really late nights here in the Weird Darkness studio doing the podcast and also doing voiceovers for my clients, and Magic Mind, if I take it around noon, it gives me the energy and the motivation that I need for a long workday. Magic Mind is offering you three free bottles so you can see how it works for you. This is different than the other URL that I gave you before, because I can only offer this for just a few weeks. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarknesstrial and then use my code darkness trial all one word and get three free bottles of magic mind again this is for a very short time magicmind.com/weirddarknesstrial and then use my code darkness trial for your free three mental performance shots of magic mind Mystery House. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. This story we're trying out for Mystery House novel tonight, Barbie, a murder with a punch. What's the big punch? Well, it's not that kind of a punch, Dan. The story deals with a Punch and Judy show. Oh, you mean those little wooden dummies that the performer works with his hands from under the stage? That's right, hand puppets. I think they're fascinating. A good Punch and Judy operator can make them almost human. Oh, I disagree, Mrs. Glenn. The Punch and Judy voices are always too unnatural. If you're going to say anything, why not say it in a natural voice, like this? Listen. <laughs> Okay, places, everybody. Uh, set the scene for tonight's story, will you, Tom? Death with a punch. The story opens in a dressing room of the Mirador nightclub. Jeff Rocklin, owner of the club, hands a little envelope to one of the performers. Yes, you notice, Gigi. Saturday night. But look, Mr. Rocklin. 
You brought me into the Munich door on the contract for six a week. So I made a mistake. We all make mistakes once in a while, don't we? Your rack's no good, Gigi. No good? The Grand Gino you know, Punch and Judy show no good. The finest hand card puppets in the world. My father and grandfather spent their lives building this act. I've got testimonial letters from royalty, from presidents, You've from... You've got the... an act that as far as nightclubs are concerned is strictly from hunger, Gigi. No, that is not so. The Berlin Winter Garden, the Vienna Olympia, the London Palladium, the New York Palace, all holdovers, top bidding, an international success. The finest hand puppet show in all the world, and you, a cheap nightclub operator, an ex-gangster... Got it, G.G. I don't like that kind of talk. Your rack's out after tomorrow night. You're done. Through. But I turned down engagements to take this. You know what that act of yours ought to be playing, G.G.? Little girl's birthday parties. That's about its speed. Here. I bet you'd knock the little kitties for a loop. You'll pay me for the balance of my contract? Are you kidding? You're lucky you're getting paid for the week you've been here, you bum. I'll report you. You fill that contract or I'll see you get no more act. No, you won't. Because I'll have a receipt to show I paid off. You have no such thing. I said I will have. Here's the receipt. See? All made out. And I've even got a fountain pen for you to sign it with. Right now. Here. You think I'm crazy? You think I'd sign a receipt for money I'll never see? I think you better, Gigi. It'd be good business. You do not scare me. Of course not. But you know how it is. A guy does his act, satisfies everybody, going along fine, getting paid. And then he has an accident. Away from the club, of course. Away from me, too. Being dead, he can't fill his contract. You would not dare kill me. Oh, now, what kind of talk is that, Gigi? I never killed anybody. If I got friends that... Uh, well, they're kind of rough. Can I help it? Just because they're bad don't make me that way, does it? Come on now, sign. No. I'll get your license revoked. You will not be able to hire any acts at all. I will run you out of business. I got boys on my payroll would take care of you without the flicker of an eyelid, Gigi. And that's just about break my heart, too. You're going to sign this or not? No. You think you are very brave and tough. Well, maybe I'm brave and tough, too. I have a contract. I know my rights. Now, get out of my dressing room. What? Hey, what is that thing? The little cop punch uses the duty over the head in my puppet show. Get out before I break it over your head. Get out! Okay, sucker. Suit yourself. But don't say I didn't give you a chance. Oh, don't worry about him, D.G. Rockland's a great A heel and as big a bluff as he's a rat. He tried to pull a fast one on you and it didn't work. He'll pay off your contract. He has to, the bum. He says I'm through after tonight. I've already made a report to the union kind. You think my act is bad? I think it's the cutest act I ever saw in my life. Those little wooden puppets are darn near human the way you handle them. It, it, well, it sort of makes me feel like a little girl again. Thank you. You know the real reason he's firing you, don't you? No. He said he doesn't like the act. Ah, he wouldn't know a good act from a flop. You came in here at top money, a big build-up and all that. And Rockland's hard up as the devil. Hard up? But the club is crowded. The prices are high. I know. And the money's going out faster than it's coming in. There's a payoff somewhere that's got him scared to death. He's scraping up every dime he can get his fingers on. What? Are you sure? Well, there's no other answer. The club's rolling in money, and Rockland's broke. And I mean broke. This payoff, uh, you know who he's making it to? For what? No. All I know is there's something going on. Somebody has him right where they want him. And it's somebody who's really turning on the heat. Connie, if anything should uh, uh, happen to Rockland, if he should... Uh, a heaven accident. Ah, not a chance. With all the thugs watching out for him all the time. But if such a thing should happen, uh, my contract would still be good. Uh, you'd be free. Isn't that true? Hey. Hey, you act sort of excited. You're, uh, you're not thinking of bumping Rockland off, are you? Oh, no. But I think Mr. Rockland has gone too far. I think he's about due for some trouble. Thanks to you. Thanks to me? You have answered the question that has been bothering me, Connie. With your story about the payoff, I think I'll fill out the period of my contract. I think everything is going to be all right. Hey, 
Hey, what was that? The door. I thought it was closed, but it must have been open a crack. Somebody was listening to us. It's what we said. Sure what? We said nothing anybody could use against us. Do not be so nervous. Face to face in a fist fight, I'd, I'd almost bet on myself to whip Rockland. But he doesn't fight with his fists, and he doesn't fight face to face. If he was spying on us, well, I'd admit it, I, I'm scared. It is he who should be frightened, Connie, not us. Mr. Rockland is just about through. Just a minute, I will see you a little bit. Evening, Mr. KG. Uh, good evening. Say, you shouldn't leave your dressing room light on. Mr. Rockland would find out you went out without turning it off. He'd be sore. Kind of mean that way. But I did not leave the light on. I turned it off, I am sure. Uh, maybe so, but I walked past a couple of minutes ago and saw the light on and stopped to talk to you. The room was empty, that's sure. And the light was on. I snapped her off. Uh, thank you. Whoop, here comes Rockland now. Evening, Mr. Rockland. Hi, Pop. I want to talk to you along, Gigi. We have nothing to discuss. I got a call from the union. I know. It would be bad for you now if anything should happen to me, Mr. Rockland. You see, I told them all about the little threats you made. Yeah, so they told me. Looks like there's nothing for me to do but pay off, huh? I hoped you would see it that way. Pop, didn't you hear me say I wanted to talk to this guy private? Me? Oh, sure, Mr. Rockland. I was just standing here. Well, don't stand there. Get moving. Guy can't do anything around his joint without somebody rubbernecking. No, I didn't mean anything, Mr. Rockland. And I didn't hear a thing. Speaking of rubbernecking, Mr. Rockland, somebody was listening outside my door while I was talking to Connie Claire this afternoon. Yeah? Did it scare you? No, I just mentioned it. Yeah, if it was nothing of any importance, you got nothing to worry about. But if it were something important? Then if I was you, I would worry about it, Gigi. Look, I've changed my mind about firing you. Oh, that is very touching. What made you change your mind? Who cares? The point is you stay. Maybe I'm getting soft for puppets. It is quite impossible for me to continue, Mr. Rockland. You gave me my notice, but you will pay for the balance of the contract five weeks without my stay. I take a little vacation at your expense. Okay, Gigi, suit yourself. And it would be most embarrassing for you if anything should happen to me. You mean about the union? You're telling them about what I said might happen to you? That too. But I stumbled onto a very important piece of information. What are you talking about? The person you're giving so much money to. The payoff. What? Listen, Now, do not get excited. I will not hurt you if you behave yourself. You know something. Something I want to know, too. Uh, this is worth dough to you, Gigi. More dough than those puppets could make you in a thousand years. You do not need to try to impress me, Mr. Rockland. You... Are you a fool? I'm leveling. Leveling? Uh, that means uh, uh, being honest, doesn't it? Sure. Interesting, if true. We're going to make a deal, Gigi. Uh, later. They are moving my punch of duty stage onto the floor. Gigi, you're on! They're coming! Now, the Club Mirador presents the most unusual novelty of the year, Gigi and his Grand Guino Punch and Judy show. Hooray! Hooray! That's what I like. Puppets. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my little puppets are not operated by strings. The oldest and classic form of puppetry, they are controlled by the human hand from beneath the stage. At several times during the performance, there will be three puppets active upon the stage, and only one person, myself, operating them. Try to figure it out. I thank you. And now, in just a moment, the Grand Guineau Punch and Judy. <laughs> And you know something? I'm a bad, bad boy. I kill people. Just a regular killer diller. Would you like to meet my wife? Judy! Oh, Judy! What is it, Squinty? Come on up and meet the folks. I don't want to. Oh, yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I won't do it, Punch. If you don't, I'll come after you with this revolver. I'll fix you good. Remember, I'm a bad boy. I'm not afraid of you. Come right ahead. Okay, I will. 
excuse me, folks. Oh, Rossman! Jeff Rossman! Gigi! Somebody quick, it's Jenny Graham! He's been shot! Hey, quiet. Not so loud. What are you trying to do anyway? Oh, listen, listen, she's been murdered. She was standing in the wings watching Gigi's acting. She was shot. Uh, Gigi, huh? I knew that guy was poisoned. The gun! The punch gun! Somebody put real bullets in it. I fired the blank toward the floor, and real bullets come out. Who do you think you're pulling, Gigi? Fired the bullets toward the floor. Look. Oh, the singer. Jenny Graham. So, you kill her and you think you'll pin it on me? Well, Mr. Rockman, you will not. Shut up, Gigi. I'm calling the cops. And it looks like you're canceling your own act for good. <laughs> Jenny Graham, the singer. And why should she be killed? If that's not enough to puzzle yourself about, was she killed by a bullet from the gun the little punch puppet was holding? We'll find out in the second act of tonight's story. And now, act two of Death with a punch. The customers have been unceremoniously ushered from the club Mirador, and Jerry James, ex-song and dance man turned police detective, has taken over. All right, all right. Sit down, all of you. I never saw a guy working with puppets yet that wasn't screwy. Sir, this is the finest hand puppet act in the world. I know, I know. And you sure brought the house down tonight, chum. Punch and Judy. I didn't know there was a punch act still on the road. Where'd you come from? Out of the woodwork? My act has headlined that the good... Skip it, skip it. Sure, you're big time. Now, why'd you kill this dame, huh? Well? I did not kill her. I scarcely knew her. That's right, Mr. James. Only woman in the place I ever see him do any visiting with was Connie here. Oh, you want to get into the act too, huh? What are you, a juggler or an acrobat? Pop's a stage carpenter. Takes care of everything backstage. Oh. Now, don't tell me. Let me guess. You're Jeff Rockland. Yeah. This is a real pleasure, Rockland. The boy's thinking awful lot of you down at headquarters. You know what the chief says about you, huh? No. He says you're the slickest little hoodlum in town. Yes, sir, the slickest little hoodlum in town. Save your cheap wisecracks for somebody who goes from. Hurry up and get this screwball puppet guy out of here before he kills somebody else. But... That's the point, Rockland. He says he didn't kill the girl. Yeah, you fool. He was holding a revolver in his hand with that punch doll. He, he pulled the doll down out of sight of the audience. There was three shots, and Jenny Graham screamed and toppled over. Blanks. I never use anything but blanks in the gun. How about this time? Somebody had tampered with the prop gun. There were real bullets in it. And you're going to claim you shot her by accident, not knowing the gun had real slugs in it, huh? I did not kill her. I could not kill her. I fired three times at the floor. You will find three bullet holes in the floor. I already found them. Somebody could have gone into his dressing room while he was out for a fact. Uh, there was a light on while he was gone. I saw it. You remember my telling you? Somebody was awfully interested in Gigi's dressing room. He and I were having a little conversation and nearly caught somebody eavesdropping. Hmm. What's your racket, sister? I direct the dancers and do the solo dance routines. I'm in charge of the line of dancing girls, the chorus. If you can call six girls a chorus. Hoofer, huh? You and me will have to cut a few touches before this is over. I used to be a hoofer myself. Look, copper, it ain't old home week. What are you going to do with this guy? Who hired him, Rockman? Why, I did. Of course. I hire all the acts. A punch and Judy act seems like an awful funny thing for a swanky nightclub. You couldn't have hired him with any idea in mind, could you? No. No idea except I was bats. I was letting him go after tonight. His act smelled. You... You cannot talk to me like that. The finest... Skip it, Gigi. Is that right? Rockland was going to let you go after tonight? Well, yes. Until he changed his mind. Just before I went on. The union was putting the heat on me, on account of a contract. 
He said I had to pay off, so I figured I might as well use the guy. You hired him for big dough, and you were going to let him go after the night. That's very interesting. He planned this. All he wanted me for was to pin a murder onto me. That ain't bad reasoning for a puppet guy, G.G. Well, don't anybody else agree? Don't ask me. I just work here. And I'd like to keep on working, if you'll get what I mean. Smart girl. There's only three bullets fired from the punch doll's gun. And there's three bullets in the floor. So that means there's another gun around here somewhere. Of course there are guns around here. And permits for them, too. All right, wise guy. I ain't interested in permits at the moment. I'm interested in seeing if there's any slugs missing from any of these guns you're talking about. Suppose you let me see them. I can let you see mine. It's in my office. Come on. All of you. I ain't leaving anybody alone. You want me to come to the office, too? Sure. This way. I didn't have the rod with me at the time of the murder. Hardly seems like there's any use looking after you telling me that. But I guess I'm just the suspicious type. Okay, wait till I unlock the door. Quite a fancy spot for a retired gangster. Well, let's see the gun. There you are. You satisfied? I'll let you know. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm pretty well satisfied. There's a bullet missing and the gun's still warm. That's a frame-up. I didn't have the rod with me. I didn't shoot it. You don't get away with this, copper, see? I'm a... Pipe down, tough guy. You hired the punch act. The girl's murdered. There's a bullet missing from your gun. You can't frame Just me Just like... a minute. This is as far as I go, Rockland. What? He was making payoffs, officer. Big payoffs to somebody. We didn't know who, but... Connie, for the love of heaven, what He was doing a big business, raking in money, and yet he was broke, flat. That money was going someplace to somebody who was shaking him down. How about that, Rockland? Okay, sure, I might as well admit I was being taken for dough. Plenty of dough. I was being kept strapped. By this Jenny Graham, the singer? I don't know, but what, that's what makes it so crazy. I ain't got the slightest idea who was shaking me down. What? I'm laughing. Okay, laugh, wise guy, but it's the truth. I get letters telling me to leave money. Leave money where? Well, never the same place twice. Those letters must have given you a pretty good reason for coughing up. What was it? That's none of your business. Guess again, Rockland. Where are those letters? I destroyed them. What did they say? How could they threaten you? I'm not saying, and you can't make me say. You found out this girl, Jenny Graham, was the one getting your dough. No, so... you fool. I didn't know who was getting it. Gigi, didn't I offer to make a deal if you'd tell me? Just before you started your act, huh? Didn't I? I? But how should I know who was shaking you down? I didn't even know such a thing was going on. You lie. I heard you and Connie talking. Oh, so you were the little eavesdropper, huh? What of it? I've been suspicious of everybody, thinking maybe anybody might be the one who was gouging me. And you think the punch guy knew who it was, huh? Well, he practically said he knew. I... That is quite true. When Connie told me Rockland was being blackmailed, I remembered something I had seen. What? I saw Mr. Rockland very carelessly drop a tube of grease paint in a dark corner backstage. A little later, somebody came along and picked it up. What of it? Oh, don't you see? It was not grease paint in that tube. The empty grease paint tube had not been used to conceal anything but money. Bills rolled into it. And this Jenny Graham picked it up, huh? No, that is what puzzles me. It was the stagehand, Pop. What? Now, look here, Mr. Geechee. You can't do this to me. That ain't so, and you know it. That won't work, Geechee. What? You can't pin it onto him. But he was the one. I saw him. No, no. I'm betting it was the singer, Jenny Graham. No. I am telling you the truth. Why, you... Trying to frame yourself was a cute little racket, Geechee. It almost worked. What? You swiped Rockland's gun some way. It wouldn't be too hard for a guy like you who's done mechanical stuff like making puppets. You'd know locks and that kind of stuff easy. But he's gone. What good would that do to me? My gun would... I know. Everybody heard three shots fired and there were three slugs in the floor. It was simple and good. Almost good enough. I don't get it. Sometime last night, when nobody was around, Gigi fired a shot into the floor right about where they'd set up his puppet stage. Nobody'd notice it. Then, tonight... He loads two slugs into his own gun before time for his act. Oh, no. You do not know what you are saying. That would be impossible. Oh, no. You're handy with both hands. Ambidextrous. 
You fire two slugs out of the punch gun into the floor, right next to the one you already planted. No. And then, with the other hand, you let Jenny Graham have a slug from Rockland's gun. You were behind the curtains of that punch stage so nobody could see you. I bet it's the first time anybody ever pulled a trick like that in front of a whole audience. No, Rockland's gun was in his desk. Oh, he... that's why you run back here to make a phone call in such a hurry after the murder, huh? I did not. Oh, yes. I... yes, you did. I remember. Why deny it? But why should I kill this girl? I did not even know her. There could have been a couple of reasons, Punchy. She'd been shaking Rockland down for money. We've been looking so hard for a murderer, we haven't even thought about money. She got it. But where is it now? I do not know. I know nothing. You figured you were really getting fired on account of her shaking Rockland down so he couldn't pay off. You wanted your money and didn't want the humiliation of getting canned. You were sore at Rockland and figured you could get even by planting murder evidence against him. You were trying to kill an awful lot of birds with one stone. But no. How could anybody fire a gun with a doll in his hand, fire it accurately enough to kill? Holding the gun through the clothes of the doll. Well, uh, shucks aside from the head and hands and feet. Those dolls are just cloth. I bet I could do it. I'd get one of them. No, no, no. You stay away from there. You fool. No. I do not let anyone rule those dolls. You Great cannot jump in whiskers. What? This doll here. I can't work my hand up into it. All clogged up. Hey, money. Look. Hundred dollar bill. And a thousand dollar bill. All right. You are so clever. I will tell you how she was getting the money from Rockland. I am not the only murderer. Rockland, he is. She had all the proof. I found James, it. I... James, look out! Rockland! I... I... I still win, Rockland. Proof. I stole from a girl. Into my dressing room. In a trunk. All about murder you committed. And now... You kill me. You did just fine, Rockland. You took care of one murderer for us, and now, even if the proof he claimed the girl had isn't any good, we've still got you on at least one murder charge, Gigi's. Yeah. Well, the proof's good enough, I guess. If I didn't think it was, I wouldn't have been paying off that kind of dough, would I? And they don't treat you any rougher for two murders than they do for one. <laughs> I have not done a live scream in a while, but I have one on the calendar now. On Saturday, September 28th, I'll be streaming live on my YouTube channel, on camera, telling stories, taking your comments and questions, and I'll even be doing a couple of giveaways during the live show. For this live scream, we'll be talking about liminal people and parallel realities. Liminal people, we know them in a variety of forms shadow people, black-eyed kids, the sleep paralysis figure of the old hag and more, even demons and angels. 
They may be non-corporeal, but somehow they can cross into our reality and interact with us. That's the subject of our upcoming live stream on Saturday, September 28th on my YouTube channel and on my website on the live stream page. The stream starts at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch the show live and send in your comments on my YouTube channel or just watch it on my website by clicking on live stream at WeirdDarkness.com. We are way past due for a live stream, so this is going to be fun. I'm live on camera Saturday, September 28th on the live screen page at WeirdDarkness.com or you can watch on my YouTube channel where you can also leave comments that I can respond to during the show. Hope to see you Saturday, September 28th. My name is Scott Douglas. My name is Scott Douglas. You sound just like me. You sound just like me. You look just like me. You look just like me. One of us has got to die. One of us has got to die. Yes, but which one? Which one? Theater 5 presents Molecule Masquerade. Darling, you home? Vera, you in here? Didn't you? Scotty! Oh, my darling! Oh, Scotty, what? Scotty! Oh, Mary, for heaven's sake, what's the matter? Oh, when did you escape? How, how did you get away? Escape? Get away? W would you mind Shh. telling... Shh. Quiet. I think I heard someone. Just a minute, darling. Now we can talk. Oh, Scotty, I couldn't understand what had happened to you. I was so worried. I couldn't believe it. Mira, what are you talking about? Then you didn't kill the man in the blue turban in Cairo? Cairo? When? This morning. <laughs> Look, darling, there's no plane fast enough to fly me from Cairo, Egypt, to New York in that time. Well, Scotty, it's the truth. I'll show you. It's all over the front pages of the newspaper. Here, see? Look at the headlines. Yeah? And, and, and the story. And your picture, too. Go on, read it. Uh, American intelligence agents in a daring action in Cairo, Egypt today captured Scott Douglas, an official of the U.S. intelligence section, as the chief criminal behind a worldwide black market operation. Killed a man wearing a blue turban? You see, darling, it's true. Not only in the papers, but all day on the TV news. I've seen you being taken by the police to the airport. I tell you, this isn't true. It's not me. Look, call my office. I ask the chief what this is all about. They know you've escaped. They'll come here and, and, and they'll capture you again. They won't do any such thing because none of it's true. Now, call him. I'll listen in on the extension. All right, Scotty. All right. Mr. Enright, please. Hello, Mira. I was rather expecting your call. Mr. Enright, I can't understand it. I just can't believe it. Well, there's no doubt of it, Mira. But how do you know? Looks and talks like Scotty, wearing Scotty's clothes, carrying Scotty's wallet and with your picture and his private papers in it. Small birthmark on the left arm, same blood type, same fillings in the teeth, and the fingerprints are exactly Scotty's. And to top it all off, Mira, I talked to him by phone. I'm... I'm sorry. I... I see. Thank you, Mr. Enright. Oh, uh, just one thing more, Mira. Scotty is due to land in about three hours. I'll send someone over in a while to pick you up. Thank you. Thank you. 
It's unbelievable. It's fantastic. Mira, I... Who I... are you? Who, Who are, are you? I? Yes. I'm your husband. I'm Scott Douglas. I'm going to call the police. No, stop it. I am Scotty. Look at me, Mira. I am your husband. No one can fool you. Look at me. Good Lord, Mira. Look, look, look. look. Here's, my, here's my wallet. Now, there. There's your picture. And, and look at... Look at this birthmark on my left arm. I know nobody could fake that. And, and fingerprints? I'll give you all you want. Have them checked any way you want. I am Scott Douglas. I am your husband. Then who is the other man? What is it? Plane from Cairo with Douglas aboard coming in, sir. Bring him in the moment he arrives. Yes, sir. Uh, would you like a drink, Mira? Uh, no, thanks. Well, here they are. All right, men. Outside. Leave Douglas with me. Right, sir. Hello, Scotty. Chief. Hello, Mira. Hello. I'll, um... I'll leave you two alone for a while. Thanks, Chief. I'm glad you're here, Mira. I was wondering if you would be. Were you? Mira, darling, you're so cold. Don't you want to talk to me? I don't know. Well, it... It's all been a terrible shock to you. I, I, I hardly know what happened myself. The last few days are a blur. All I remember is a, a, a hotel room in Cairo, a man with a blue turban, the police. I, I panicked. There was a fight, a shot, the arrest, the black market talk. I, I don't know what it means. Mira, you, you look so strange. For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Don't touch me. Don't touch you. I'm your husband. Oh. Oh, darling, don't, don't darling. <laughs> I can't pretend. You're not Scotty. You're not. I'm. I'm not Scotty. Amira, stop this hysteria at once. This is crazy. Let me. Let me see your wallet. My. You mean this? Yes. Oh, here. There it is. Your picture. Yes. And where did we go last summer? To Paris. For two weeks. We stayed at the Georges Cinq. What did we do when we first got there? <laughs> we opened the window and sang a silly song about Paris. We made it up as we went along, and... And then I kissed you. We were alone. No one could have seen. I don't know how you know these things. Now, uh, you seem to be Scotty, and yet you were home. Mira, but I, I, I was on the plane. You saw that. I, all, all right, darling, if you say, oh, take, take, take it easy, honey. Don't cry. <laughs> I've got the reports from Cairo, Chief. Give me the highlights. The man in the blue turban was Mustafa Cornelius. He made his living selling pictures and art. Well, what was he doing in Scotty's room? Probably picking up some pictures. And Scotty said he doesn't know how they got there. Even when we showed him Egyptian police reports that he and Mustafa had been followed. And Scotty was carrying pictures. Oh, so he was lying. No, he wasn't. His lie detector test came through 100%. I didn't know that. And why was Scotty in Cairo anyway? He had no orders to go there. Well, how did he explain that? He didn't. He said he couldn't remember. <laughs> it sounds like two other guys. That's not so funny. What do you mean, that's not so funny? When Scotty got off the plane, I left him and Mira together. I listened to their conversation over the intercom. Oh? Learn anything? I don't know. Mira seemed to doubt it was Scotty. Now, wait a minute. It was Scotty. You and I know it was Scotty. Now, why wouldn't Mira know it was Scotty? I don't know. Two other guys, huh? Well, we know that the Scotty who got off the plane is safely locked up in this building. You and I are going to see his wife and try to figure this puzzle out. Come on. She doesn't 
an answer, Chief. Try knocking. Oh, hello, Mr. Enright. Hello, Chief. Scotty. I don't know how you did it, but escape. I didn't escape, and I've never been to Cairo. I don't know what's going on, Enright, but I'm glad you're here so this whole mess can be cleared up. All call headquarters. Yes, sir. Now, don't move, Scotty. Scotty, you and I have been friends for ten years. What kind of a game are you playing? It's not a game. I don't know what this is all about. All I know well, is... You'll get it all straightened out in just right. a minute. Chief. Yes? They uh, say Scotty is still there. In his cell. What? Get them to put Scotty on the phone. Yes, sir. Okay. We'll get to the bottom of this pretty quickly now. That's right. Come on. Yeah. Chief wants to talk to you. Here he is, sir. Keep him covered. Hello? Yes, Chief. That you, Scotty? Yes, sir. I just wanted to be sure. Chief, what on earth is going on? You don't have to talk to me to be sure. Okay, Scotty. Scotty? Well, who are you talking to? To Scott Douglas, who got off the plane from Cairo this morning. But I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, have you seen Mira? I want to talk to her again. Just hang on a moment. Now, just repeat after me. I'm Scott Douglas of Intelligence. Well, now, look, you know... Oh, all right. I am Scott Douglas of Intelligence. Okay, let's hear you say that. Chief, are you crazy? Say what I tell you. I am Scott Douglas of Intelligence. They sound exactly alike. I'll talk to you later. Goodbye. And you're coming along with me. What are you going to do? Mrs. Douglas, I'm going to take you and your husband to meet your husband. <laughs> Bring him in. Mira, Scotty, you stand over there. All right, Chief. Now, once and for all, tell me. I... Mira. Oh, darling, I'm glad. Good Lord. Mr. Enright, I can't believe it. It's absolutely incredible. He looks just like me. What is this? Chief, Have is... either of you two ever seen each other before? Every morning in the mirror. What kind of a gag is this? One of you two is an imposter. I will say this, the resemblance is fantastic. You, the one we had in the cell, we've got your fingerprints, teeth identifications, birthmarks, and so on. When you were arrested, they all verified that you are the real Scott Douglas. I've told you that all along. I'm Scott Douglas. Chief, whatever is we'll going... We'll know who you are in a few minutes. We'll have the results of the fingerprint and identification check we had you take before I brought Scotty up from his cell. Yes? I've got the report, Chief. Well? Fingerprints, teeth identification, birthmarks, everything checked, sir. They're both Scott Douglas. <laughs> All right. Now, remember, don't interrupt me. The only way I can tell you two apart is by the clothes you're wearing. You, you're wearing a tropical suit, the one you had on when we picked you up in Cairo. Yes, sir. I'm going to call you Tropical. And you, with the Tweed, that's your name, Tweed. Right, Chief. The last two hours of questioning reveal that your two memories are identical up to four days ago. Whatever intimate and family questions you were asked separately, you both answered the same. But as of four days ago, the police interrogators report that you, Tropical, are almost blank until the arrest and murder in Cairo. That's right, sir. On the other hand, you, Tweed, you have a clear memory except for a few hours three days ago. Here, let me read it. Pursuant to file 198, I was ordered to visit a Mr. David Eintner, suspected of dealing in black market paintings at 569 West 18th Street and pose as a buyer of rare paintings. Mr. Eitner conducted himself in a reasonable and normal manner and exhibited several paintings, allegedly genuine old masters. During our conversation, I heard a faint oscillating sound in the room and inquired whether it was the air conditioning unit. And then I blacked out. Now, at this point, your two memories separate. You both remember everything up to the moment Scott Douglas blacked out. But after that, Tweed's memory does not pick up until about two hours had passed. Then he reports... The next thing I knew, I awoke lying on the floor. Subsequent police investigation failed to reveal any trace of Mr. Eitner or his paintings. So there it is. And you, Tropical, you remember nothing for the next several days until we picked you up in Cairo. I remember that report very well. 
I wrote it. But he couldn't have known about the first part of that report. I went alone. No one else. I was there. And that is my Stop report. it, you two. It's bad enough seeing double without you two talking double and remembering double. <sighs> two hours. Two hours. What happened in those two hours? Chief, I've got an idea. What is it? Probably nothing to it after three days, but... Why don't we visit 569 West 18th Street again? Let's see whether Mr. Eitner possibly left something behind when he fled with the paintings. Thank you. This is the place. Now well, it's pretty empty now. This is where he had several old paintings hanging on the wall. And this is where I was standing when I blacked out. That's right, Chief. I walked over there from here, and then it happened. What's that? That sound? Came from over there. That closet. Come out of there. Come on. Come on, or I'll shoot. Do not shoot, Sahib, please. Who, who are you? Do not kill me, Sahib. Talk. I, I come to destroy the instrument. What instrument? The instrument of Mustafa Cornelius. Sahib, please. The man in the blue turban. I swear to come back and destroy it if he ever dies. It is built into the closet. It makes Mustafa and me very rich. Let's see that instrument. Open that panel. Looks like a control board. What does it do? I do not know the words to describe it. Only Mustafa knew. Do you know how to operate this? Yes, Sahib. Mustafa, show me. Show us what it does. Uh, give me something. A picture, perhaps. There are no pictures here. Then a ring. A watch. Perhaps a shoe. Anything. Does this make any sense? I'll play along with him. Here. Here's the ring and a watch. Yes, thank you, Sahib. I place them in here and close the door. I turn on the instrument. That's the sound, the sound I heard. He's right, Chief. The sound before I blacked out. Now what do you do? A moment, please. Ah, it is finished. Now, you see. There are now two watches. Two rings. Let me see them. Oh, they're exactly alike. He, even to the scratches. The, the dirt marks, everything. Let me see them. You're right. Identical, perfect copies. No, no, Sahib. Mustafa say all are original. Chief, look at this marking. Molecular duplicator. What did you say? Molecular duplicator? That's right. That means that somehow the molecules and atoms of the originals are perfectly duplicated. And we know that if somehow the atoms and molecules could be exactly arranged, you'd actually have two originals where only one existed before. Yes, Sahib. That is what Mustafa say. Does this machine work on living things? Dogs, birds, human beings? It has worked on a dog, Sahib. Mustafa... He had a dog. He liked so much, he made himself another dog like it. Uh, but the dog, I do not know which one of them. Uh, the dog, he died. Very horribly, Sahib. What do you mean, died horribly? One day, about a month after the first dog becomes two dogs, one day, the dog, he bark and whine. It is an agony, Sahib. And before my eyes, it... I, I do not know how to say. It is... Disappear. Slowly. As if it fall apart. What? And in a little while, there is nothing left. Nothing. Molecular disintegration. On living flesh, the effect of the machine lasts only a limited time. Chief, one of us has got to die. One of us has got to die. Yes, but which one? Which one? A 
the way I understand it, uh, this person came into your home and stole all of your radios. Every radio I had to my name. Mm -hmm. Including transistors? Yes. Well, he left me one earplug. I'll say that for him. Mm -hmm. Well, did he take anything else? Just uh... the radios. And a couple of pieces of fruit. I see. Well, what... A uh... banana and two cadota figs. Mm -hmm. I well... don't deny him the fruit. No. Are you and your husband going to replace the radios? Well, or... we'll have to. Arthur is late for work because he has no radio to keep reminding him of the time and traffic conditions. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to keep me company while I work around the house. I can imagine. We have a ten-room house. We had a radio in every room. Uh, then he stole all ten radios. Eleven. Eleven? He also stole the car. <laughs> has presented Molecule Masquerade, written by Sherman Dreyer and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, George Petrie, Vicky Bola, Louis Van Ruten, Peter Fernandez, and James Monks. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlasdotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Hey, weirdos. Who are you? Oh, hey there. It's me, Darren Marlar. What are you doing here? I'm here to tell people about the next weirdo watch party. You don't remember me. <laughs> are you kidding? You're Bella Lugosi. You're a legend. That's why we're showing your film, Spooks Run Wild, on Friday, September 27th. We ain't waiting for nothing. We're going right now. Well, you can visit the page right now if you want to. The Monster Channel page does have horror movies and horror hosts 24 hours a day. Uh, but the movie I'm here to tell you about is just Friday night, September 27th. It's hosted by Horror Hotel's Lamia the Vampire. She's a vampire like Bella Lugosi. It says here that in the night he prowls about seeking new victims, and in the daytime he sleeps in a coffin. Well, let's wait till daytime. The East Side kids hear about a monster killer roaming the countryside, and when one of them gets shot... <laughs> uh, I don't think that's funny, but anyway... Uh, when one of them gets shot, they seek aid at an old mansion, and they run into Bella Lugosi. You scared the health out of me. Did you just say scared the health out of you? I haven't heard that one before. Anyway, the fun begins Friday night, September 27th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch, so tune in at showtime, watch the movie with me and all the other Weirdo family members, and even join the chat during the film for more fun. We're always cracking jokes during the movies, and this is a horror comedy, so it'll be even more fun. <laughs> it's Lamia from Horror Hotel presenting Bella Lugosi in the horror comedy Spooks Run Wild, Friday night, September 27th. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-horror movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV, and we'll see you Friday night, September 27th.
murders of homicide, 6 p.m. Check. What are my instructions? You will shoot to kill. Presenting The Whisperer, starring Carlton Young. The Whisperer, a brilliant man who, losing his voice in an accident which crushed his vocal cords, worked his way deep within the crime syndicate to help destroy it from within. To the underworld, his familiar rattling hiss is the voice of authority, to be obeyed without question. Then a miracle of surgery performed by Dr. Benjamin Lee restored his natural voice, enabling him to resume his real identity. Now, as Philip Galt, aggressive young attorney, he skirts the thin edge of death living his dual role. For as the whisperer, he sets in motion the forces of the syndicate in Central City. Then, as Philip Galt uses his knowledge to fight the organized network of crime which seeks to control the fate of millions in cities and towns across the nation. Now in the apartment of Ellen Norris, the only one besides Dr. Lee, her employer, who knows that the whisperer is really Philip Galt, brilliant young Central City attorney, we find Philip speaking in the voice of the whisperer to his superiors on the syndicate in New York. Lieutenant Denver. That's right, Ellen. Denver's been a thorn in the syndicate side for a long time here in Central City. Thanks to the information you've managed to get to Denver. Oh, he's such a nice guy, Phil. Couldn't you have ignored the syndicate and forgotten to pass on their instructions to the killer just this once? Too much of a chance, Ellen. Playing both ends against the middle the way I am with the syndicate all the time, I'm lucky they haven't got suspicious of me already. Even if they only suspected you weren't completely on their side. Phil, why don't you just call Denver's and warn him? Tell him to be on his guard, that the syndicate is... And then, when he asked me how I happened to know... Oh, I didn't think of that. But you're not going to just sit by and allow him to be murdered, Phil. May I use your phone again, darling? If it's for the syndicate, no. If it's against the syndicate? In that case, dial away. Thank you. Could I, uh, without being nosy, ask who you're calling? Lieutenant Denvers. But you said... I said I couldn't warn him, but I've got to do something. I can ask him to... Shh, hold it. Denver speaking, homicide. Good evening, Lieutenant. This is Phil Galt. How are you? Suspicious. What's on your mind? Dinner, Lieutenant. I'd like to invite you and your charming wife out for dinner this evening. On you? On me. Did I hear right? Of course. Can't I ask you to dinner without raising your suspicions, Lieutenant? No. You're antisocial, Lieutenant. Not an invitation out of the blue like this. Not after years of getting in my hair on cases and spending your time fighting my evidence in court. Well, that's something else again. That's business. As a man, as a friend, I like you, Lieutenant. There isn't an ulterior motive within miles of me right now. I just want to... Ah. Honest, Lieutenant. How about it? Well, even if I believed you, Gold, I couldn't. The wife and I are eating out tonight, all right. We're taking some friends to dinner. Oh, too bad. Well, maybe I'll take a rain check. Okay. Goodbye, Lieutenant. He won't come? Can't. He has a date. What was the idea of inviting him, anyway? Well, I figured as long as I was with him, I could keep an eye peeled for this Neely, the syndicate's hired killer I just spoke to. I I guess now that's no good. Now, hey, wait a minute. I know what I'll do. Uh-oh. Five will get you ten. It's going to end up by having us miss dinner altogether. Quite the contrary. I'm going to do just what the killer's going to do. Kill Denver? All the killer knows is that Denver's will be coming out of headquarters around six o'clock. About 20 minutes from now. You'll probably be parked near headquarters waiting for Denver's. But I don't think you'll risk shooting him there. He'll follow and wait for a better opportunity. I don't suppose, as usual, you know what this, this, this Neely, this killer, really looks like. No, I don't, Ellen. He's another one of these uh, syndicate men imported to do their dirty work. And chances are he's not working alone. But with luck, we ought to be able to spot him before he gets a chance to shoot Denver. We hope. We hope. Come on, put your face on so we can get going. I want to be parked near police headquarters when Denver's comes out. As I said about dinner... Now, don't be silly. A little delay will just sharpen your appetite. Notice anything new and different? In the car here? It's got to be a new gadget of some kind. Uh Uh-uh. No? I see you've still got the wire recorder installed behind the dash. You didn't take it out as you threatened. I decided it might come in handy sometime again. Keep looking. I don't... 
What's that? Connected to the steering pole near the dash. Well, that can't be a telephone, can it? You win the gold plate is you, Lauren. Care to try for the Cadillac? A telephone in a car? What good is it? Oddly enough, for making telephone calls. Well, that's impossible. I never... Ah, there's old, there's old hat, Ellen. You're way behind in your popular mechanics. I guess I am. Done by radio. Well, why go to all the trouble to develop such a thing? Can't people drive to the nearest phone booth or something if they have to make a call? It's not only for making calls, Ellen. Doctors driving their rounds can be contacted in an emergency. Uh, companies with fleets of cars or trucks can contact them on the road during the day or night. I see. And also as a toy for gadget-happy characters like you. Oh, that's unkind. I'll bet I get a lot of use out of it. Mm-hmm. Like calling the telephone company to check the time of day. Very funny. <laughs> you just wait. And... Uh-oh, there's the police headquarters down the block. Several cars parked across the street from it. we better stop here. There's a man sitting in one of them. Just one? Usually they work in pairs. I only know about Neely, but then the syndicate doesn't tell anybody everything, not even me. What do we do now? Go up and ask him if he's waiting to shoot Lieutenant Denver? If we're anxious for a bullet ourselves. Otherwise, we wait and see what happens. Look, there's Denver's car parked right in the front of headquarters. I wonder what restaurant the lieutenant's going to. I just hope he gets there in one piece. How can you think of food when a man's life is in danger? Oh, it isn't me. I'm very altruistic. Always thinking of the other fellow. But my stomach has a mind of its own. Look, here comes Denver's now, out of headquarters. Suppose you're wrong, Phil. Suppose maybe he shoots now, from his car. It's a gamble. I gotta hope he doesn't. He's almost to his car now. The man in the other car hasn't moved. That he... fellow isn't Neely. Maybe Neely's hidden somewhere else, just waiting to shoot. There. Denver's in his car. Nothing's happened. Yet. He's driving off. Whew, that was a bad moment. It isn't over. There goes the other car, making a U-turn and following Denver's car. Isn't that illegal? In the middle of the block? No, that's a woman for you, worrying about irrelevancies at a time like this. The important thing is that the car following Denver's is almost certainly being driven by Neely with a gun cocked and ready. What do we do now? Follow both of them. It isn't a cinch trying to head off a syndicate man intent on killing. I've lost Lieutenant Denver's car, Phil. Probably a couple of blocks ahead of us now. I'm having no trouble keeping the green sedan Neely's driving in sight. I didn't get a very good look at Neely back there, did you? No. He had that hat pulled down. Hey, he's turning off. Going into that parking lot of the Chateau Frank. Denver's must be meeting his wife and guests in there. A restaurant. And famous for their sauerkraut and potato pancakes. Yum. Do we get to follow them in? I think it can be arranged. Oh, this isn't going to be such a bad evening after all. Here comes the head waiter, Phil. I hope he has a table. Oh, I'm sure. famished. Healthiest appetite in Central City. <laughs> Two, sir? Oh, yes, please. Right this way. Oh, uh, would you mind? I'd rather sit on the other side. Hmm? Oh, of course, if you prefer, Mr. Oh, what difference where we sit, Phil? He was taking us to a table six feet from Denver's party. For what? Aren't we allowed to eat dinner here? After my inviting him out tonight? Policemen have suspicious minds about coincidences. Uh, how is uh, this table, sir? Uh, uh, perfect. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, would you care to order now, sir? I would. I'll have a sauerkraut. Yes, miss. You, sir? Mm, sauerkraut will be all right for me, too. Fine, fine. Drink first. Ellen? Uh-uh. If I sharpen my appetite any more, I'll eat the tablecloth. <laughs> Nothing for me, either. Yes, sir. Uh, pardon me a second, Ellen. Don't tell me. A telephone call. Uh-huh. As the whisperer, no doubt. It's not so loud. I'll be right back. Already? My uh, other life doesn't take up much of my time. See anyone that looks like he might be Neely? Oh, well, that uh, dark man. Oh, no, no, I don't think so. He must have come in here. We saw his car drive into the parking lot. Yeah. Uh oh. Headwaiter has been speaking to Denver's. Denver's headed this way. What for? I don't get it. I don't think he has anything to do with us. I, I don't think he's even seen us yet. Maybe if we put the menus up in front of our faces. No good, Ellen. He spotted us. Well, Philip God. <laughs> You're sure a persistent guy, aren't you? Hello, Miss Norris. Hi, Lieutenant. Denver's. <laughs> Quite a coincidence, huh? 
Well, what do you mean, persistent? Well, if you invite a fellow out to dinner and he refuses, you just follow him and force him to eat in the same restaurant with you. <laughs> Suspicious nature is an occupational disease with the police. Yeah? Well, then why did you steer the head waiter away from our side of the restaurant and have him seat you over here? Oh, you saw that, did you? Uh-huh. Well, I didn't want to crowd you, Lieutenant. Didn't want you to think that I was following you. Why, are you? Of course not. But now that you're here, why don't you sit down and have a... No, I can't right now. There's a phone call waiting for me. Well, maybe later then, huh? Well, He is a suspicious policeman. Phone call for him, huh? You know, Ellen, maybe he's not suspicious enough. Where are you going? Make sure that's a genuine phone call. You haven't forgotten one of the syndicate's killers is waiting for a chance to get his sights on the lieutenant, have you? No, but why leave me here? Now, your food will be along in a minute. You just sit tight. Oh, no. You're liable to disappear, and I can't eat two orders of sour Oh, no? (laughs) Come along, then. It's probably nothing to worry about anyway. Phone booths are over this way. On the way out to the parking lot. Nobody around, Phil. Both phone booths are empty. Uh, What I was afraid of. Phil, wait. There goes Denver's car. Come on. Come on, where? To our car. Oh, so we can follow him and make sure he's not walking into a trap? He's not walking into a trap. He's already in it. There was a man sitting next to Denver's, a man with his hat pulled low over his eyes. You you think he had Denver called up by the head waiter on a fake telephone call and was waiting for him at the telephone booth? I'm sure of it, Ellen. As the car went by me, I got a quick look inside. Neely had a gun. And if I know anything about a syndicate trigger man, Neely knows how to use it. Where's Denver's car? I don't know. Now, keep your eyes peeled. I don't even know what we can do if we do spot it. But I do know Lieutenant Denvers will be dead in a matter of minutes if we don't. You are listening to The Whisperer, the story of Philip Galt, who skirts the thin edges of danger living his dual role. Philip Galt, known to the syndicate of crime only as the Whisperer, has set in motion the syndicate's plan to kill Lieutenant Charles Denvers of Central City. But now, in his real identity as Philip Galt, counselor at law, he is trying desperately to stop Neely, the syndicate's hired killer, from carrying out the skillfully planned murder. The killer has forced Denvers into his own car at gunpoint, and now Phil and Ellen follow in Phil's car, desperately trying to pick up the trail so they may prevent the lieutenant's murder. How do we know they went this way? We don't, but it's logical to suppose Neely's forcing Demers to drive to the outskirts of town so he can kill him in private. And this is the quickest way out of town. Right. And if we're wrong, oh, Phil, if only you hadn't passed the syndicate's orders on to this Neely character. Then someone else would have. Yes, I know. And they wouldn't have tried to stop the murder from happening like we are. But if we don't find Denver's car... I'll never forgive myself. Phil. What is it? Straight ahead at that corner. Isn't that... It looks like Denver's car, all right. Hang on, sweetheart. We're the going light's to... changing, Phil. Then we'll just have to... Oh, we can't. Too many cars stopped ahead of us. We'll have to wait. Oh, Phil. We'll catch up, I hope. If only there was some way to get the police to... Phil. What? Your telephone. You can call the police. Oh, why didn't I think of that? Because you're too busy berating yourself for getting Lieutenant Denver's in his predicament in the first place. Light's changing, Ellen. i got to concentrate on my driving. You better call. What do I do? Just pick up the phone and ask the operator for police headquarters. Press down the button to talk. Release it to listen. I give the operator that number on the windshield. Operator, this is JL22469. Police headquarters, please. And hurry. Well, I tell them. Exactly what's happening and where we are. Hello? This is Miss Ellen Norris, calling from an automobile driving north on State Boulevard. Lieutenant Denver's life is in danger. Yes, a car. We're following Lieutenant Denver's car. Tell him to get off the dime. He's being forced to drive out of town by a man with a gun. Well, he won't shut up. Press the button. Cut him off. Oh. Now, you listen to me. We're in a gray two-door sedan. License number 4A3216. You know Lieutenant Denver's car, don't you? Tell him we're just crossing Cedar Street now. Still traveling north. We're still on State Boulevard traveling north. And we've just crossed Cedar Street. Yes, yes, please, Hurry putting out the message to all squad cars in this area. We ought to have help in no time. Not too many cars in this part of town. It's only partly built up. Well, Phil, we're practically out of the city already. What do we do if the police don't get here in time? I don't know, Ellen. Darn this syndicate with its killings all the time. Not getting mixed up in it. No more street lights. And we're the only two cars on the road as far as I can see. I just hope Neely doesn't see. You'll know we're following. 
And with that gun, he could make life difficult for us. Anyway, we won't lose them out here. But they're turning off on a side road. Chances are he'll spot us for sure now. Maybe. Maybe he won't shoot Denver when he finds out we're following. Careful, Phil! Oh, move. He came off a course to the edge of that canyon. He'll probably make Denver stop and walk off the road away before he shoots him. When he try to interfere, he'll just use two more bullets. Phil, they're speeding up. They must have spotted us. He can't know we're following him on purpose yet. Probably just wants to lose us. Ellen, get on that phone again. Squad cars won't know where we turned off. They'll keep going north on the main highway and miss us completely. Hello, operator? Operator! That car of Denver's is souped up to go a lot faster than mine. I better try to head him off while I still got a chance. Darn that, operator. Hello? Operator! Operator! How can you stop them, Phil? Force them off the road, maybe. It's a chance, but if they get away from us now... Operator! They only have one operator on the car service now. Sometimes they get tied up on long distance. Oh, fine. Operator, operator. No use shouting into the phone, Ellen. She won't cut your line in until she's free. What do I do? Just sit and wait while Denver's car gets lost? Nothing else you can do. But I don't think they're going to lose us. Neely doesn't know Denver's car is souped up, and there's no reason Denver should drive to his own murder any faster than necessary. We are gaining on them, Phil. Uh-huh. Better get down, Ellen. Down underneath the dashboard on your side there. Why? It's safer. Try to relax so it won't jar you too much when we hit. Hit what? Denver's car. I'm going to force him off the road. Now get down. Okay, okay. Now I'll... Just relax. Relax, he says. We're just about next to him now. Neely hasn't got any idea what's coming. Thinks we're trying to pass him. Hang on, sweetheart. Now relax. Relax. <sighs> hey, you... Are you, uh, you all right, darling? Uh, I guess so. My dignity is kind of bruised. Can I get up now? Well, you, you better stay where you are. Denver's car took a worse jostling than this one, but Neely may still be in a shooting condition. I'm going out to see what happened. Be careful, Phil. Oh, Luke, stay where you are. Don't make a move. Denver's, is that you? Oh, God. I thought so. Oh. Hey, what happened to, to the other fellow? Got banged around a bit when you ran into it. He's still asleep. Oh. Pretty tight squeeze, huh? It would have been a lot tighter if you hadn't come along for the ride. Guess I ought to thank you, huh? You probably saved my life. <laughs> Don't make too much of an effort. How did you know it was me following you? I got a look at you as I drove out of the restaurant parking lot with Neely's gun in my ribs. From the look on your face, I figured you knew what was happening. Where's his gun now? <laughs> this is it. If he happens to come too suddenly, he won't be so dangerous with his fangs removed. Phil, I'm getting awfully cramped up in here. Huh? Oh, sorry, sweetheart. Come on out. Oh, you would have gone on chatting with Lieutenant Denver's all night if I hadn't opened my mouth. Well, I guess my car will still drive. I'll take that hood back to headquarters. Right. We'll follow. Here comes the car. Maybe the police. Down behind the car. They're shooting at us. What now? That car's pulling off the road. Well, as soon as he gets out of that car, he's going to get a blast. I'll ask questions later. He won't be able to hit us as long as we stay down. Uh, he got out of his car on the far side. Probably going to try to come around the end of his car and nail us. i better teach him some manners. I'd better keep him on his side of the road. Better keep down, Devers. He's pretty impatient for a target. Yeah, this looks like a standoff. Somebody hears those shots and calls headquarters. What? What in blazes is that? My telephone. Your what? Out here in the middle of nowhere? Has he gone off his trolley, Ellen? He has a telephone in his car, Lieutenant. Oh. Where are you going, Gold? Going to crawl back to my car and answer the phone. Maybe the police trying to get to us. Find out where we are. Wait a second. There's ten feet of open space between our cars. You'll be a perfect target for that guy across the road. Yeah, you can. I can't. got a chance, it. I'll make like a snake crawl on my belly. Uh, cover me with your gun, Lieutenant. All right, but be careful. Can you see the man across the road? Can you tell if he can see Phil? No, he's hidden behind his car. But if he sticks his nose out to get a shot at Phil... Uh... There. Stuck his nose out and I missed him. Well, I got him behind his car anyway. Well, Phil got to his car safely. Oh, he's answered the phone. Lieutenant, look out! Uh, you! Yeah. Oh, thanks, Ellen. Oh, Neely, he, he was about to smash that rock on your head. Yeah, well, Neely won't be trying to smash any more people's skulls in. Dead? Yeah. Well, I shot good once this evening anyway. The other one's driving off, Lieutenant. Come on, in your car, Lieutenant, after him. He's got quite a head start. Well, we'll catch him in this. We'll do 110. What was that phone call, Phil? Police calling back. Their squad cars couldn't find us. I told them to set up a roadblock at the intersection of this road with the main highway, just in case. You think they had time? Well, no, soon enough. The rate we're going, we ought to... There, straight ahead of them. 
Two squad cars across the road with their headlights blazing. We won't be able to stop in time, Phil. He'll... He's turning off the road. He went over. This is three hundred foot drop. Oh, you think he? Houdini couldn't live through that. We, we better get down there. Have a look. No, I have some of the boys take care of it. I'll drive you back to your car and get back to the restaurant. My wife will be wondering what happened to me. Well, let's all get back. Our food's still waiting. Not that I have any appetite left after what happened tonight. Hmm. Very thoughtful of that head waiter, keeping our orders on the stove. <laughs> no appetite, she says. Yeah, a real persistent guy, Gold. You got me to have dinner with you after all. Mm-hmm. But I'm sorry your wife didn't wait for us. Ah, she's used to me running out on one sort of urgent business or another. I hope it isn't always as urgent as this was. Lieutenant, uh, what about that man who crashed the bottom of the canyon in his car? Any identification on him? No, the car was rented. You drive place never saw him before. We sent his fingerprints on to Washington. Yeah, probably another one of the syndicate's hired killers from out of town. The syndicate? You think they were behind this attempt to kill you? Well, it's a logical thought. I've been getting in their hair lately. Yes, it does sound logical. Mm hmm. Of course, you wouldn't know anything about it. Me? How would I? Hmm. Well, what was it you wanted to see me about, Gaw? Well, uh, nothing. Uh, I told you, just a friendly dinner together. I see. Well, after tonight, I guess I ought to leave it your way, huh? Thanks. Uh, pardon me, I'll be right back. Where now? Just got to make a telephone call. Look out for guys with guns waiting for you. <laughs> I will, Lieutenant. And while I'm gone, keep an eye on my potato pancakes. That girl sitting next to you knows no loyalties when it comes to food. Hello, New York. Murder of Lieutenant Denver's failed. Both our men killed. Entire police. Alerted for Denver's safety. I will check for further instructions with Chicago at midnight. The Whisper is based upon stories and characters created by Stetson Humphrey. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Carlton Young is starred as The Whisperer. Betty Moran is Ellen. Others in the cast were Paul Fries and Paul Dubuff. Don Rickles speaking. The Whisperer was written by Jonathan Twice, produced and directed by Bill Karn, original music by Johnny Duffy. Let next week, listen to another exciting adventure with... The Whisperer! As a result of the disastrous floods in Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Illinois, the President of the United States has asked the American people to contribute $5 million through their local chapters of the American Red Cross for the relief of flood victims. Over 45,000 families have been affected by the floods, and an estimated 12,000 of these will register with the Red Cross for assistance. Emergency needs are overwhelming, but immediate aid to the victims, food, shelter, clothing, and medical care is only a part in caring for those whose lives have been disrupted by the disaster. Give and give generously. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. 
Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 for political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. It's the Frontline Theater. <laughs> Today bringing you a real thriller, the strange case of Professor Wanger, and as our extra special guest of honor, Tommy Dorsey and his orchestra. This is Ken Niles to welcome you once again to the Frontline Theater. Brought to you men in the armed forces of the United Nations by the Special Service Division of the War Department. This is your theater, and every performance in it is presented especially for you, the men fighting with the United Nations on freedom's front line. Our play is an exciting story, The Strange Case of Professor Wanger. And because it's curtain time in the front line theater and the play's the thing, let's get on with the show. Over New York, night has fallen. And in the apartment of Nick and Nora Charles, Irwin Harris, a friend, discusses his new job. Like I say, Nick, here I got a steady job bodyguarding Professor Wanger. So you think everything will be perfect? Well, isn't it? Positively not. Irwin, nothing's happened to the professor. How could it when all the time he locks himself in a house and he never goes out? Well, that should make your job a lot easier. Sure, but then I'm taking money for nothing, which ain't ethical. So, I think I'll quit. Oh, and do what? Well, what's wrong with the stage? Nothing, and let's try to keep it that way. Did you ever hear me recite? Erwin, I warn you, you'll be putting a severe strain on our friendship. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary over many a volume of forgotten war, suddenly there came a rap. Hmm, sound effect. That wasn't me. Uh, come in. Oh, excuse me, Erwin. I better see who that oh, is. Oh, let me go, dear. I don't mind a bit. Just a second, I'm coming. Yes? Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to disturb you. Just one more tack and I'll be through. Uh, say, what are you nailing there? Isn't that a funeral wreath? Yes, indeed. One of Hekemeyer and Brothers' loveliest creations. Oh. A luscious spray of calla lilies surrounded by the purity and innocence of white chameleons. Excuse me, Mr. Jerk. I... Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Heike, Heike A very common error. Oh, yes. Well, I think you're making a mistake. Madam, the fame of Heike and brothers are not given to mistakes. Well, there's no one dead here. At least I haven't seen a corpse in days. Is this apartment 5B? Mm-hmm. Are you Mrs. Charles? Why, yes. There's no mistake. The wreath is for Nicholas Charles. What was that name again? Nicholas Charles. Nick. Nicky! Yes, dear? Oh, thank heaven. Call me, baby? Uh-huh. Darling, this is Mr. Herkemeyer. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Believe me, my heart goes out to you in your hour of grief. What's the matter with him? He thinks you're dead. Oh. oh what? Uh-huh. And he's got a wreath to prove it. See? <laughs> Look, my little man, you're a trifle premature. 
I'm afraid you'll have to take that thing back with you. Oh, I couldn't possibly. What would the customer say? Well, I don't know. Who is he? Oh, a noble soul. He paid cash. <laughs> What's his name? Uh, he neglected to leave one. No, uh, no, Mr. Charles. The wreath will have to stay. I'm sorry, pal. I can't use it. Well, what'll I do? And couldn't you put it back in stock? Madam, are you suggesting that I tamper with the records of Herkemeyer and brother? Why, it would be sacrilegious. Well, that's your problem, but get this thing out of here. M Mrs. Charles, I ask you to bear witness. I am not doing this of my own volition. Uh-huh. Attaboy. If, if you should change your mindset... Yes, I'll let you know. Uh, you, you wouldn't reconsider it now. No. Uh, nothing personal, you understand, but I hope I never see you again. You will, Mr. Charles. Mark my words, you will. Good day. <laughs> Did you ever see anything like him, darling? Nicky, why should anyone send you a wreath? Oh, I don't know. It was just a gag. Well, it wasn't very funny. What's the matter? Something wrong? Someone just sent Nicky a wreath. Oh, sure. excuse me. Mm. Hello? Hello, uh, Mr. Charles. Yes? Uh, a short while ago, a funeral wreath was delivered to your door. Oh, yes. yes. Well, if you're one of the Herkemeyers, I explained to your brother. It's all a mistake. It was no mistake, Mr. Charles. I sent it. You sent... All right, pal, what do you want? Uh, listen, unless I've been misinformed, a young couple will be up to see you shortly. They'll have a request to make of you. Take my advice, Mr. Charles. Turn them down. Otherwise... Otherwise what? You'll find you were much too hasty in returning that wreath. Well, that's Act One of The Strange Case of Professor Wanger. And now, during intermission, let's hear from today's special guest, Tommy Dorsey and his orchestra. We're certainly glad you accepted our invitation, Tommy, and we're turning the spotlight on you while you play one of those swell arrangements that have made you famous. The stage is yours, Tommy. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy Dorsey. That was a swell tune. The men overseas will dust off the welcome mat for you anytime you and your boys want to play a return engagement. And now for Act Two of The Strange Case of Professor Wanger. Two hours passed since Nick received the menacing phone call which explained the delivery of that wreath. Oh, Nora, there's nothing to worry about. It's just a practical joke. Here, I'll prove it to you. Mm. Our anonymous friend warned me that a young couple would be here tonight, hmm? All right, it's almost 11. Do you see any sign of them? What were you saying, dear? Never mind. That's what I thought. Good evening. Hello, won't you come in? Oh, I, yes. 
Oh, uh, please sit down. Oh, th- thanks. Uh-huh. Say, isn't this a little uh, unusual, or are you this hospitable to everyone who rings your bell? Uh, it's her southern blood. Uh-huh. Uh, don't mind my husband. The truth of the matter is we were expecting you. You were? Uh-huh. Uh, oh, Nikki, this is... Uh... Uh, I'm Sylvia, and this is my brother, Jim. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Now, I don't believe I caught the last name. It's Wanger. Wanger? Any relation to the famous scientist? Yes, he's our uncle. As a matter of fact, that's why we're here. I understand that his bodyguard, Irwin Harris, is a very good friend of yours. Yes? Well, ever since Uncle escaped from Czechoslovakia, we've been trying to get in touch with him. And so far, all we've gotten is a brush-off. Well, don't blame Irwin for that. He has his orders. Dr. Wanger doesn't want to see anyone. But that's ridiculous. Is it? Well, yes. You see, we, we, we know that Uncle lives under the constant fear that the Gestapo's after him. Surely that's no reason to refuse to see his only living relatives. So you want me to arrange a meeting for you? Oh, hmm? you only would, Mr. Charles. I'm sure if Uncle would talk to me, I could convince him he has nothing to fear. When did you see your Uncle last? Well, we, we never really saw him. You see, before my father came to this country, he quarreled with his brother. But now that Papa's dead, we decided we'd to bury the hatchet. Yes, that's, that's right. I don't suppose the fact that Dr. Wanger has a fortune in patent royalties in this country had anything to do with your decision? Now, look, Mr. Charles, not even you can say that and get away with it. Now, don't pay any attention to him, Mr. Wanger. He's awfully suspicious by nature. But he's got a nicer side, too. You'll find it out after he helps you. Well, darling, aren't you being unduly optimistic? You mean you won't? Uh-huh. If Dr. Wanger wants to see them, that's for him to decide. Nikki, would you change your mind if I asked you to? Oh, I'm sorry, dear. But beginning this week, I'm making it a practice not to interfere in things that don't concern me. Well, I never thought I'd have to admit my husband could be frightened by a phone call. Oh, now, baby, you know that's not true. Well, then prove it. Introduce them to Dr. Wanger. Oh, conniving woman. Are you really so set on this thing? Yes, I am, Nick. Now, bless your little heart. Then I think you'll have to do the honors. <laughs> Hello, Irwin. Oh, it's your nose. Uh-huh. Open up the door. Well, okay. Oh, thank you. Say, say, wait a minute. Who are these people? Oh, some friends of mine. I knew you wouldn't mind. No, no, none of that. Now, you're all here for scram. No, well, I'm surprised at you. You know the professor gave me strict orders. Well, all right, Irwin. I'm sure Dr. Wanger would be very happy to meet this couple. Now, be a sweet boy and get him. I'm sorry, but the prof positively can't be disturbed. He, he's uh, retired for the evening. Oh, when I think you're fibbing. Now, won't you get him for me? Please. No. Pretty, please. With sugar on it. Oh, cut it out, Murray. Hmm. You know I can't never refuse you nothing. Isn't he a darling? You won't be long, will you? Sit down. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Mrs. Charles, you're wonderful. I did manage that rather well, didn't I? Who said we needed Nick? I think you'd better let me do all the talking. Oh, of course. I never get a chance to when Nick's around. You know, sometimes... Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Charles? Oh, there you are, Professor. How are you? Uh, just fine, fine. <laughs> Thanks for the asking. Mrs. Charles, you know, I make it a rule... Never to see anyone. Well, I thought you wouldn't mind making an exception in this case. Professor, I'd like you to meet your nephew, Jean. My my nephew? Mm-hmm. And this is your niece, Sylvia. Hello, Uncle. Uh, I never heard of you before. We should tell me who you are. We're your brother Rudolph's children. Rudolph's children? Yes. I realize that doesn't prove anything, but I have papers... Uh, please, that... please, there... There's no point your showing those to me. Papers mean nothing. They could be for. Sure, it's easy. I once knew a guy who was so slick with a pen. Erwin. Oh, sorry. Uh, Professor, you can't turn them away like this. You can see with half an eye they're not imposters. How can you accuse them of being after your money? Oh, you, you do not understand. Money means nothing to me, Mrs. Charles. I, I am a man of simple wants. I, just ask to be left alone. Oh, please, Uncle, you've got to let us stay. There's no other place we can go. We won't be in your way. What do you say, Professor? 
You've got to trust someone. Won't you let them stay? Uh, you, you make it uh, very hard for me to say no. Oh, Uncle Darling. It's, it's all right, my oh, dear. Professor, I'm sure you'll never regret it. Yeah, I hope so, Mrs. Charles. I sincerely hope so. <laughs> Well, darling, I trust you're satisfied with yourself. Now that you've mentioned it, I am. Brings back memories of your Girl Scout days, doesn't it? Mm, Who could that be at this hour? Darling, there's a well-tested way to find out. Come in. Erwin. Yeah, it's me. Nick, I gotta talk to you. Okay, sit down. Uh, You know what Nora went and done? Yes, I heard all about it. Well, you should never have done that, Nora. Well, why did you want to palm off a couple of phonies on a swell guy like the professor? They're not phonies. Erwin, you shouldn't say that. You've only known them for an hour. For that hour? <whistles> you fair brother and sister, I'll eat your hat. Well, what do you mean? Look, Nick, I come from a big family, and we was as affectionate as the next. But you ought to see the way that Gene kissed Sylvia goodnight. That ain't the way we used to do it. Hmm. Could it have been an act to impress the professor? Uh-uh. If you ask me, I'd say they was saboteurs. Oh, well. Well, it's sure a peculiar time for them to pop up. Why? Look, this is strictly sub rosy. But the professor is working on a submarine detector for the government. Now, I ask you, ain't it funny they should train up the night before he's supposed to run a big test for the big shots? It, it, well, it, it might be a, a coincidence. See? Even you're not so sure. Look, Nick. I should like very much for you to show up tomorrow night. Just to see there's no hanky pank. Well, I'll have to think it over. Yeah, yeah, do that. But uh, whatever you decide, I ain't taking no for an answer. Some train out, ain't it, Nick? Yes. What time does this experiment start? Oh, uh, any minute now. Uh, everybody's here who counts. Oh, there's Sylvia. Hello, Mrs. Charles. Can I get you anything? Oh, no, thanks. Okay. Where's your brother? I don't believe I've seen him tonight. Gene? Why, uh, uh, he's around somewhere, I guess. Say, come to think of it, I saw him go out about a half hour ago. Oh, yes, that's right. I think Uncle sent him out for something. That's funny. Well, if he ain't back soon, he's going to miss the show. Hey, there, the professor's almost ready to start uh, now. The gentlemen and... And the uh, ladies, you are, you are all here tonight to see a demonstration of a submarine detector your government has asked me to work on. If my assistant will help me, we will proceed. Jean? Oh, he, uh, he isn't here, Uncle. He isn't? Well, no, no matter. Erwin, will, will you lend a hand here, please? Oh, gladly. What do you want me to do, Professor? I pull down this switch marked A. Yes, that is the one right there. Now? Yes, please. Right. Now, gentlemen, you, you will notice how the needle fluctuates on this meter here. In just a moment, I will explain the purpose of that. Erwin, you throw in the next switch. You better... Oh! Come on, try those lights. Uh, Erwin! Erwin! Don't move, Nora. Don't anybody move. Who's got a match? Here you are, sir. Oh, oh. Steady, darling. He, he can't be. Erwin, isn't he? Yes, I'm afraid so, baby. Erwin has been electrocuted. <laughs> Remember this, Nick. My job is to get a confession. If you and Nora talk out of turn, I'll spin you out of here so fast you'll feel like a yo-yo. We'll behave, Sergeant. All right, Smitty. Open them up. Hello, Sylvia. No, no, I didn't do it. I didn't kill Irwin. Listen, Miss Ranger, whatever your name is, none of this phony sob stuff is going to get you any place. It's too bad your little plan didn't go off like you expected. 
do you mean? You were after the professor, weren't you? I tell you, we didn't mean to kill anyone. Just meant to frighten them a little, huh? Where's your accomplice? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Nick, you believe me, don't you? Tell me something, Sylvia. You claim that you and Jean were sister and brother. Oh, we, we are. You're lying. His name isn't even Wenger. Well, mine is. Then you're not related. Yes, we are. We're married. Yeah? Sylvia, do you know where Jean is? No. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. But don't you see, dear, if you don't, we can't help you. I don't want your help. Jean will get me out. I just wish he'd try. Okay. Think it over, Toots. And when you do, I'll bet you'll come to the same conclusion I did. That swell husband of yours left you holding the bag. <laughs> What are you thinking about? About Erwin. He was a pretty swell guy. Uh-huh. You think Sylvia and Jean did it? Don't you? It's all my fault. I never should have taken them up to the professor in the first place. Well, I don't know, baby. Maybe it would have happened anyway. Well, how could it? Well, you're forgetting one thing, dear. That funeral wreath. Who sent it to me? I did forget. Nick. Do you think the man who sent it will make another attempt in the professor's life? Oh, oh, not so fast, sweetheart. Now you're assuming that Jean and Sylvia aren't guilty. Darling, don't ask me why, but I'm positive they're not. I'll bet you anything you want that the man who threatened you on the phone is our murderer. There's only one fly in the ointment. How are we going to find out who he is? Hmm. How about your friend Hickemeyer? The florist? Uh-huh. Oh, he wouldn't know. Remember you asked him. Yes, but maybe if he were prodded, he might come up with a description. What do you say, Nora? You willing to try it? Well, in a case like this, no sacrifice is too great. Step on it, darling. You better wait in the car, Nikki. I think I'll do better by myself. Go ahead, beautiful. But... Don't let him swindle you into taking that wreath back. Oh, don't worry. I'll try to make this quickly as possible, Doc. All right. Uh, yes, madam. Is there something I can show you? Hello, Herky. Remember me? I beg your pardon. You delivered a wreath to my apartment last night. Oh, of, of course, and, and you made me take it back. Uh-huh. It was a mistake. Oh, I know it. I know it. You, you, you knew what? He had a relapse. He died. No, Mr. Herkemeyer. He didn't die. He didn't? No. See? He's waiting outside in the car. You mean you haven't come for the wreath? No, I, I'm sorry. Oh, Mrs. Charles, you simply must take it. Well, you don't know how it's upset this entire organization. Why, my brothers and I... Look, Mr. Yes, Herkimer, I couldn't you give it to the man who, who bought it? Well, I, I don't know his name. Was he ever in here before? No. Could you describe him for me? Um, I'm not very good at games. Well, suppose I prompted you. Wouldn't that help? It might... Um, well, was he tall or short? Uh, short, I think. Oh, now, we're getting somewhere. Did he have any distinguishing marks? Distinguishing marks? Mm-hmm. I mean, did he, he, he limp or anything? Oh, now that you mention it, I believe he did. Did what? Uh, limp. Are you sure? Uh, almost. Well, um, what about the color of his hair? It wasn't red by any chance. Yes, I think you're right. And, of course, he had a cauliflower ear to match. Uh, let me think. Uh, cauliflower ear. Uh, Mrs. Charles, oh. where are you going? Well, but, Herky, you, you're an awful disappointment. Oh, am I? Oh, Mrs. Charles, you're race. You're forgetting it. Oh, Mrs. Charles, please. <laughs> Darling, 
It looks as though we're stymied unless you come up with something brilliant. I don't have to pass, beautiful. All I can suggest is that you phone Sergeant Reynolds and have him post a guard around the professor's apartment. Oh, I'll take it. Hello. Hello, Nick. Yes, who's this? This is Gene. Gene, where are you? Never mind, and don't try to trace this call or I'll hang right up. Do you know they've locked up Sylvia? Yes, that's why I phoned. You've got to get her out. Well, that's impossible. Now, look, Gene, why don't you come up here and talk to me? I'd like to help you. You expect me to swallow that yarn? I mean it. Well, uh, all right. But don't try any funny stuff. If you tip off the cops, you won't live to regret it. You hear me? Yes, I hear you. When will it be over? Give me half an hour. Okay. Well, darling? He's coming over. That proves he didn't kill Irwin. Does it? Well, certainly. Otherwise, he'd never put in an appearance. Yeah, maybe. Look, honey, will you get Sergeant Reynolds on the wire? Nicky, you, you wouldn't do a thing like that. I certainly would. You remember you said if we found the man who threatened me on the phone, we'd have our murderer? I still say it. Well, in that case, the man hunts over. I just heard that same voice again. Nick. Yes, baby. It was Jean. What time you got, Nick? Relax, Sergeant. Relax. He'll be here. I just hope your boys downstairs don't frighten him away. Uh I'm very tired, gentlemen. Is it necessary that I remain? I'm afraid so, Professor. And that goes for you, too, Sylvia. Quiet. Come in. No, Gene, don't. It's a trap. What the... Come in, fella. Get those hands up. All the way. Oh, will you close the door? Gene, I tried to warn you. It's all right, honey. I guess I've got Mr. Charles to thank for this. Uh Uh-huh. You dirty double-crosser. You never should have threatened me, Gene. That happens to be a pet aversion of mine. What are you talking about? The night you first came up here, you sent me a funeral wreath. I can explain that. Yes, so can I. Now, you wanted me to introduce you to the professor. You knew I wouldn't. So you applied simple psychology. You sent me the wreath and ordered me not to. And you figured I'd do just the opposite. The only trouble was I refused to bite. But I did. Yes, darling. You stuck your beautiful neck way out. You did exactly what they hoped for when you took them up to their uncle. Ah, uh, I am not their uncle. I'm sorry, Professor. That's quite true. You're crazy, Charles. Do you deny you sent the wreath? No, but I do deny killing Irwin. Now, wait a minute, pal. I never accused you of that. You never... What are you talking about, Nick? That's what I said. Darling, I don't understand. Uh, but you do, don't you, Professor? These kids aren't related to you. No, no of course not, eh? They are imposters. Well, that doesn't necessarily follow. The shoe could be on the other foot, couldn't it? Come on, Nick. Don't be coy. What are you getting at? The professor's the imposter. He killed Irwin. What? Uncle, you didn't. Uh, All right, everybody. Stay as you are. Better put away the gun, Professor. It's out of character. Get down, Nick. Oh, oh. Professor. Professor. You're wasting your time, Nick. I never miss. All set, dear? Mm-hmm. Then out go the lights. Nikki. Oh, Nora. Darling. Oh, well, it's fairly simple, dear. Sylvia's uncle, the real Professor Wanger, died in Czechoslovakia. And our phony friend was an opportunist who assumed his name and finances. See, it never occurred to us that he could have been the bogus article as well as Sylvia. But well, why did he kill Irwin? Well, he had to. He was on the spot. The government wanted him to work on a submarine detector, but not having the real professor's ability, he couldn't deliver. But if his life were in danger, he'd have a valid reason to stop working. Yes, exactly. Oh. But what put you on the right track, darling? Well, we were overlooking one thing. The actual result in the case was Irwin's death. And if you assume that was what was really intended, you got yourself a brand-new suspect with a brand-new motive. Mm, I see. But, darling, Mm -hmm. there's one person I'm sorry for. Who's that? Herky, the florist. No. (laughs) Think of it. For the rest of his life, he'll be stuck with that wreath. All right. Mm. You hear what I hear? Uh Uh-huh. 
It sounds like... Someone's nailing something on the door. It's Herky. It's undoubtedly. Well, darling, here we go again. Well, men, that solves the case and brings down the curtain on today's frontline theater play. But there are more plays coming, and your favorite stars will be in them. So keep on listening, won't you? Our thanks to the makers of Woodbury Soap for their cooperation. Frontline Theater is presented for you men in the armed forces of the United Nations by the Special Service Division of the War Department of the United States of America. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is an 1886 Gothic novella by Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson. It follows Gabriel John Utterson, a London-based legal practitioner who investigates a series of strange occurrences between his old friend, Dr. Henry Jekyll, and a murderous criminal named Edward Hyde. Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of the most famous pieces of English literature and is considered to be a defining book of the gothic horror genre. The novella has also had a sizable impact on popular culture, with the phrase Jekyll and Hyde being used in vernacular to refer to people with an outwardly good but sometimes shockingly evil nature. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Hear the full audiobook absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. True Detective Mysteries. In cooperation with the editor of True Detective Magazine and the Mutual Broadcasting System, True Detective Mysteries, brought to you by Exlax, America's largest selling laxative. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, $1,000 reward is being offered for information leading to the capture of a dangerous criminal. A complete description will be given later on this true detective mystery, which follows in a moment. You probably know what you're going to do every minute you drive, but do the other drivers know what your plans are? In other words, do you signal your intentions to other drivers every time you want to turn, stop, or do anything else that might not be expected of you? Well, the law says you must. Your own common sense must tell you you should. Most cars today are equipped with mechanical turn signals. Use them, but be sure to use them correctly. If you use a turn signal for indicating your direction at the fork in the road, and you should, remember that the turn may be so gradual that the signal may not turn itself off as many do after a 90-degree turn. Be sure your signal is off after it has served its purpose. There is probably nothing more frustrating and dangerous than following a car with turn signals flashing away and the driver blindly driving straight ahead. The National Safety Council urges every driver to use turn signals correctly, safely, 
at every turn. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now the voice of the editor of True Detective magazine. The case history you are about to hear is the actual report of an actual crime. When she was a little girl, she told police they used to have a saying, but what you didn't know would never hurt you. I've kind of changed my mind about that. I didn't know John Nasser until a few hours ago, and even then I didn't know his name. But he hurt me. He hurt my husband more than anyone else ever did, and I hope more than anyone else ever will again. This is Grace Hospital. <laughs> again? A young woman, Mrs. Mary Ann Webster, oh. slim but athletic, more. brunette and pretty, courageous. I'm being in that trunk, air. Very right courageous, no as air. you shall hear. Grace Hospital, room 18, emergency ward. In her own words, detectives, police steno near bedside, Mrs. Mary Ann Webster coming fully out of sedation now. Robert and me, we've just been married a year. Robert's an engine mechanic in the Air Force. For the holidays, he managed to wangle a 10-day leave, so we started out for a Christmas visit with his people. And then my folks, and it was swell seeing them, both sides, his and mine, and the presents and food and happiness and all. And then we got ready for the start back. I was wearing shorts and a sweater and a sports coat. Robert stepped on the accelerator, and we waved goodbye to the folks. I snuggled up to Robert, put my head on his shoulder. If I'd had any idea of what was about to happen, believe me, I not only couldn't have slept, I'd have run to the nearest police barracks. It was early in the morning, about 2 a.m. Oh, hey, hey, honey. Hey, mm -hmm. Marianne. Hey, there's uh, a hitchhiker. Shall we pick him up? Uh-huh. Oh. Well, there's not much traffic. He might have to stand all night. Hey, you got room, folks? I'm going down the line. Oh, hop in. Oh, fine. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Ro Robert Webster. This is my wife, Mary Ann. What's yours, mister? Ah, uh, what's in the name? We're only... We're only ships that pass in the night. I didn't hear you. We're only ships that pass in the night. Were you kids just married? Hey, hey, has anybody got a cigarette? We've been married almost a year. Uh, here. Ah, thanks. <laughs> Somehow you remind me of a couple of honeymooners. This sort of flattered me because we've been married a long time. Well, not long, I guess, but it seems like a long time. We've had arguments and everything already. If that sounds like Robbie and me didn't get along, I don't mean it that way. It's just that we weren't a pair of flighty lovers. We'd adjusted to marriage and felt like an old settled-down couple. We drove along for about 150 miles. John smoked and he didn't talk. I must have fallen asleep again on Robbie's shoulder. Oh, uh, wood latches oh. come loose. Oh. I guess we're near Sulphur Springs. That's about, uh, that's about 60 miles this side of the city. Um, what? What are you doing? John. John, the hitchhiker beside me, John, had pinched me. I turned around shocked. I, I saw he had a gun in his hand. I was terrified. Terrified. Robbie came back, and as he got in behind the wheel, John, the hitchhiker, pushed across me, and before I knew what he was doing... Hey. Hey, what, what, what are you doing? You flipped? Robbie, hey. I didn't. Robbie, not me. Robbie, he's got it. A... She didn't give you that love tap, Buster. Oh, hey, hey, put that away. You out of your mind? But you'll flip if you're not careful. Now, do as I tell you. The long honeymoon's over, kid. I tried to say something I couldn't. I sat. I stared at the gun in front of my eyes. The gun he was aiming across me at my Robbie. I was paralyzed. Oh, now, listen. We, we don't want any trouble. My, my wife's going to have a baby. If, if, if this will hold up okay, I, I got about 15 bucks. Now, take it and, and leave us alone. And take all the presents in the back seat. They're worth something, too. It's not exactly a stick-up. Well, take a car, too. I, I don't want my wife harmed. You hear what I said? I don't want her harmed. It won't do. Traffic along here. Somebody'd pick you up and you'd have the cops on my tail in 20 miles. Just keep driving. Slow. Perfect. Like you're right out of driving school. Find a nice, quiet country road. No! Start the car up. No. Start her up! <laughs> Go, I said! 
Back to True Detective Mysteries in just a moment. One of the popular magazines coined the phrase, never underestimate the power of a woman. Well, to paraphrase that, saying, never underestimate the power of a man to help a boy. For the past 50 years or so, the Big Brother movement has been proving how true that is. A Big Brother is not a trained social worker. He's simply a man who's willing to give some of his time and energy and ability because he's concerned about the welfare of young people. He knows how much the genuine friendship of an adult can mean to a boy who's been emotionally battered and bruised because there was no one for him to turn to. And he knows, too, that there are few satisfactions greater than that which comes from helping a youngster over the rough spots. So if you believe that we should never underestimate the power of one man to help one boy, and if you would like to become a big brother, then please contact your local big brother agency or write Big Brothers of America, Philadelphia 3, Pennsylvania. That address again, Big Brothers of America, Philadelphia 3, Pennsylvania. This message is brought to you as a public service. Now again, the editor of True Detective magazine. Continuing the statement of Mrs. Mary Ann Webster. My heart was pounding something terrible. I couldn't talk. I couldn't scream. I tried to once when another car flashed past us, but no sound came. I prayed. All right. In there. In there, I said, straight in ahead. Turn into it. Yeah, it's a bumpy road. A mile or so, you kids can get out. If you'll get the gun out of my eyes, maybe I could see. <laughs> We gonna get to the city. I was gonna drive the car to the city and leave it at the railroad depot. Now you've started arguing. Who's arguing? I changed my mind. All right. Out, soldier. <gasps> I said out. Out of the car. Walk. <laughs> now you just stay in here and keep your mouth shut. Maybe that way you won't get hurt. Soldier! I... I watched them. I... Do what he says, Marianne. He's, he's not going to kill Marianne. Oh, Robbie. Robbie. He's going to let us live. Mary. Marianne. Do as he says. What? What's he gonna do? He swears he'll kill us both. Oh. Now obey him. Better obey him. Because he's insane. He just as soon kill us. Now let's not let's not give him a chance. Come on! <laughs> the trunk. We were locked in the trunk, but the car didn't start. You! You you let her alone. I'll give it to you right now, soldier, to your boat. And I don't even have to carry bodies. You, I said! Me? Out! Uh. Robert in the trunk, I forgot my own terror. My Robert locked in the trunk, this man we've been generous enough to give a lift, this madman with the gun. Here. Get it. I'm trying. No, no, I don't care what you do. I'm not I going to. get in the car. Drive me. I want to be with Robbie. All right. <laughs> just get in, hon. Just get in. Hun. Oh, hun. Please. Please, 
Jammed, we were jammed, Robbie and me, jammed up against each other. Robbie kept telling me to do exactly as that monster said, and eventually he'd let us go, but I don't think Robbie believed it. He was just saying it to make talk for my benefit. Robbie put his arms around me and held me close. Oh, it sounds mushy now, I know, but we told each other how much we loved each other. It was the real thing for us. We prayed, and, and Robbie tried to keep me from crying. <laughs> He's stopping. He's he's stopping for gas. He got my money. He said he'll shoot us in the, in the gasoline attendant if we make any noise. Honey, honey, easy. He left the motor run. The exhaust fumes came into the trunk. It was choking me. It was unbearably hot. Then he started up. <laughs> Back to True Detective Mysteries in just a moment. More families, far more families, use X-Lax than any other laxative. X-Lax is the preferred laxative for one important reason. X-Lax helps you toward your normal regularity, gently, overnight. Today, many doctors recommend trusted X-Lax for youngsters as well as grown-ups. That's because X-Lax gives you the relief you want, the gentle way that nature wants, Without upset, without embarrassing urgency. When you take chocolated X Lax at night, it does not disturb your sleep. And X Lax is so effective that the next morning you'll be well on your way toward your normal regularity. Seldom, if ever, will you need X Lax the next day. Little wonder that of all the laxatives made today, tablet, powder, or liquid, X Lax is the most popular. Next time, any time that you or any member of your family needs a laxative, Make that laxative pleasant-tasting chocolated X-Lax. Introductory size, only 15 cents. Now again, the editor of True Detective magazine. Continuing the statement of Mrs. Mary Ann Webster. Robbie was bleeding badly where he'd been smashed with the gun barrel, his head and his face. He tried to stop the bleeding with an old pair of trousers that he found in the trunk, but he couldn't make a very good job of it. There was a lug wrench in the trunk. Robbie got hold of it and tried to force the lid up a little so that we wouldn't smother. After a while, using the wrench and, and pushing his feet against the lid, he managed to spring the lid up a little and fresh air trickled in and out. Oh, it was like champagne. Up until then, we hadn't had any hope of getting out alive. When we could see it was getting daylight, I twisted around and stuck my fingers through the crack under the lid, hoping, oh, how I was hoping somebody would see them, my fingers. Robbie tried to hold the crack open, but he was weak from the pain he'd gotten, and the lid closed down tight again on my fingers. Oh, my fingers got pinched so badly they bled. Once, once the car stopped for what must have been an hour. Again, he kept the motor running, and the heat, and the exhaust, and the fumes. <coughs> open! Well, open up, Will! Open up, Will! I could tell from the sound of the tires that we left the highway. Then from the tires, I knew we were back on the highway again. I didn't know what that meant. Robbie was unconscious. His head bobbing an inch from mine. His mouth was open. I could see his tongue. And every so often his eyelids, you know, his eyelids flickered when we hit a bump. But that was the only sign I had that my husband was still alive. And the thoughts that ran through my mind of the many times I'd been mean and selfish and, and good. Oh, how so very good a man my husband was and how, oh, Lord knew how. And I prayed uh, but of how I would be good and never nag and pick. Oh, Lord, if we could only get out alive. I'd given up hope. Uh, do, do as... Oh, yes, honey, yes. Don't... Yes, lover, yes. Mary. Oh, I can't. I can't get my fingers out again. Here, here, here. I'll try. I'll try again, Robbie. You... You tried to sleep. I tried. Oh, I tried. I was so cramped. Robbie was lying now against me, 
his weight, he, he was unconscious again, and his weight on me, I, I, oh, oh, please, please, somebody, please, there must be other cars, people, please, someone see my fingers sticking out there, please, please. <laughs> hey, hey, you, slow down, pull on the stairs. Help, help us inside. <laughs> All right. Oh, he's got a gun, get his gun, get his gun, he'll shoot you, please don't let him. Oh, easy, easy, lady, easy, 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 young lady, that's, that's my, better. My husband. Then an ambulance clanged down the highway. Robbie was still alive, but I heard the ambulance doctor say something about severe loss of blood and possible monoxide poisoning because of the blood loss, and I, I must have passed out, too. Then I was here in the hospital, and you all are treating us so well, and I'll be all right now that I know Robert will live. Really, I will. You are the policeman, aren't you? Well, yes, Mrs. Webster. Yes, lady. I, I don't know how to think. Well, just, just, uh, just you relax oh. now. You lie back. Could I ask you what you and, and, and all you detectives... Sure, sure. Well, uh, his, uh, his, his name is... He's, he's, uh, he's a killer mm -hmm. named uh, Nasser. The John part was correct, ma'am. He escaped from State Prison Farm about 33 days ago, overpowered a guard, then he robbed and unnecessarily stabbed him. He's been uh, <clears throat> serving a life sentence on a first-degree murder conviction, yes, ma'am, no. since January 1947. A murderer? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> See, I was actually out on a parking meter checkup, ma'am, and a, a man I know, uh, Hal Fisher, he runs a tire store. Now, I was stopped there, you know, talking to Mr. Fisher. Uh, he's the one who actually <laughs> spotted your fingers sticking out the trunk of your car. I, I appreciate you worrying at the time about him having a gun, ma'am, but you see, when I came up close behind you and I, I saw your fingers were running blood, I, I knew this was trouble, so I had my own gun out and Pointing right for his head when I give him the siren and pushed him over to the curb. Thanks. Thanks again. Oh, you... You betcha, ma'am. Except for the use of fictitious names and places, this has been a real story of a real crime. Solved by real people with a real criminal brought to justice. But be on the alert. A vicious criminal is at large and may be in your neighborhood. As editor of True Detective magazine, I offer a $1,000 reward for information leading to the capture of Thomas Francis Connolly, Jr., one month from the date of this broadcast and as a direct result of listening to this broadcast. But first... Planning a trip? Unexpected trouble can occur anywhere. Did you know that you can receive immediate, confidential help wherever you are throughout the nation at Traveler's Aid... Friendly, experienced Traveler's Aid workers will assist you with any difficulties you may have while you're away from home. Traveler's Aid is a non-profit, non-sectarian organization located on the piers and in transportation terminals in over 100 cities in the United States and Canada and supported entirely by voluntary contributions from the public. Among its services are protective care for children traveling alone, the aged and the handicapped, and guidance and counseling for individuals and families on the move, as well as help on any job, personal or family problems related to travel. Remember, if ever you are in trouble, away from home, contact Traveler's Aid. A good suggestion. If you're in trouble, away from home, contact Traveler's Aid. This message is brought to you as a public service. And now, here are the details regarding the wanted criminal. Thomas Francis Connolly, Jr. is being sought by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on a charge of bank robbery. He is alleged to be one of four men who held up a branch of the Chase Manhattan Bank 
at Woodside, New York, early on the morning of April 6th, 1955. Thomas Francis Connolly Jr. is 32 years of age, 5 feet 9 inches tall, and weighs 175 pounds. He has blonde curly hair, blue eyes, and a fair complexion. The fugitive has the following marks of identification. A diagonal scar on the right side of his forehead, a scar under his chin, and another below his left jaw. A two-inch vertical scar on the back of his left wrist. His previous occupations include steam fitter, floor waxer, bricklayer's helper, and merchant seaman. Connolly may be armed with a machine gun and a pistol, and should be approached with caution. If located, notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Do not call your local radio station, but notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. And get in touch with the editor of True Detective for the $1,000 reward. True Detective Mysteries has been brought to you by Chocolated X-Lax, America's largest selling laxative. London, England. A woman notifies Scotland Yard she has nightmares in which she sees her friend walled up in a closet. Upon investigation, the dream is found to be a reality. The dead woman's husband is charged with murder. Read the complete story, The Corpse in the Cupboard, in True Detective magazine, now at your newsstand. And when you're getting your copy of True Detective, be sure to buy Sport magazine, the magazine for sport fans. Look for Carmen Basilio on the cover. Silos, haylofts, corn cribs. A farmer certainly knows how important it is to store food for the future. And when he has extra crop money, a farmer buys United States savings bonds regularly, too. He stores away bonds to protect his family's future, as well as the future of his farm through this safe, systematic way of saving. Today, Series E savings bonds are a better investment than ever. The interest rate's been raised to three and a quarter percent. And you get back $4 at maturity for every three invested. Savings bonds mature faster, too, in just eight years and 11 months. Savings bonds also come in a new, convenient punch card form. They're smaller, about the size of a bank check. Don't put off putting something away. Enjoy a more secure tomorrow. Buy improved United States savings bonds today. True Detective Mysteries is written, directed, and produced by Peter Irving, the part of the editor is portrayed by John Griggs. Also heard were Pat Hosley and William Redfield. This is Ed Ladd speaking. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. 
be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous, original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. Your Bigfoot expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon, or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. Back where it must have been a few thousand years ago. Sebastian, 
I've got it. That sky. That sky is the sky of about 5,000 years ago. Oh, how can that be? What does it mean? It means we've been knocked out of our own time orbit. We've been here 5,000 back, years back in the past. The whirlpool thrust us away. The whirlpool. It was the universal space-time conversion center where all the orbits of space and time converge. Like the, 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 the spokes of a wheel. Only we came out on the wrong spoke. When we get back to Earth, Sebastian, my calculations are correct. We will be in Egypt in the year 3000 B.C. That's it, Sebastian. Robot landing alarm. Strap yourself in, say your prayers. We're going to crash land in less than 30 seconds. Walking quietly, the great house, pilot of the pharaohs. 
Even if we die here, it'll have been worthwhile. Just to To gun the cell. I don't know what that one said, but the whip's clear enough. Following through that door. But that... That's the throne room. I've seen pictures of it reproduced from paintings on pyramid walls. And that tall one with a great gold ring on his left hand, the green basalt scarf on his breast, is the pharaoh. Stand erect, Sebastian. Look at them so we're gods. You're no actor, neither am I, but you've one ounce of drama in your soul. Now's the time to use it. Get in our 2,000 plus 100 gadgets. He's getting up. Is the voice blender set? Yes, I need a moment to sort of warm it up. It'll overcome the language barrier. It always has. Walk slowly, very slowly, tawdy man. Talk with dignity. Noble Pharaoh, we come to you as messengers of the sun god Ra and Osiris, god of seals and of the rivers. Our ways are the ways of the gods, and we bring you miracles of life and life after death. Ryosin, Ryosin, holy power. The first miracle will now be past, O Pharaoh. Listen, O Pharaoh, and our words will be understood by you, and yours by us. Speak to us, O Pharaoh. And Kulifa asks that you tell us from whence your great sky bird comes. The gods have sent us, Kulifa. Before we speak again, strike the chains from our wrists that our thoughts may be of peace and understanding. So be it. Vizier, Tukan, strike the bonds. Remove the bonds from the wrists of the strangers. They have spoken in a strange tongue that is not ours, nor yet the tongue of Babylonia and Assyria, and yet the words have meaning. Even as your words, O Pharaoh, have meaning for us. Why have you come within our gates, strangers? We know not why, O Pharaoh. The will of the god Ra is strange and unpredictable. Our course was charted without our knowledge. The great skybird that brought us here lies upon the sands of Giza, tired from the journey. We must return at once to care for it. Let food and water be brought to the skybird that it may be refreshed. Prepare baths of oil and precious spices and fresh shifts of linen for the strangers. I, Kolifa, Pharaoh of all Egypt, bid you welcome to the land of the Nile and invite you to rest before you return to the great bird. Tukan. Tukan awaits the royal command. Let the high priest prepare a feast for the sun god Ra and his messengers. Lead them to their chambers now, that they may bathe and rest. I, Kolifa, have spoken.
he plays with the lilies of the pool, and always his eyes are upon his queen. She is there beside him. I leave you now. But come closer, emissaries of the gods. Approach the royal presence. Queen Hispatu wishes to gaze upon you. How fair their skin. How like gold their hair shines in the sun. I've never seen eyes so blue. No men so stalwart. Nor we, a queen, so beautiful. Have you rested well, messengers of Ra? What do the gods of Egypt have in The warning. Why are the brasses sounded? What new tragedy has struck the house of Colifar? Nay, for the second time since the moon was in its infancy, the tomb of your mother desecrated, the sacred vessels of life after death, that you should be destroyed by those who will not let her rest in peace. And now, this... Don't give your two call, O king. My tongue is rooted. My throat distressed. The brass is sound. What new misfortune to come? Speak to me, vizier, or I will have that tongue torn from its roots and have thee rendered limb from limb. Speak. What plague has descended now upon the house of Pharaoh? The little prince, so small, so helpless. My son, no. The guards murdered, even as he lay in his golden cradle. Some madman intent on evil snatched him from his linen sheets. The little prince has been abducted. I, Horifa, hero of all Egypt, command you, my soldiers and slaves, to search the bulrushes and the riverbeds and fields and houses. My son must be found, alive or dead. Bring me back the flesh of my flesh, the prince who is the last of the line of Colifar. I, Colifar, king of Egypt, issue this warning. For those who have robbed the grave of the dead queen, my mother, those who have robbed the cradle of my son, the living prince, the penalty is death without burial. I have spoken. See how the lily flows upon the bosom of the Nile. The body of my child may be feeding them. You are messengers of the gods. You have said so. You have magic far beyond the powers of the court magicians. The instrument that makes your speech and ours intelligible to each other. The great bird that carries you through the heavens. These are miracles beyond the dreams of even a pharaoh. You must use this magic. Even to the gods of pharaoh, there are some things that are not possible. Our magic cannot find your son. He is so little, stranger, with great dark eyes and trust in his heart. Egypt is vast, your majesty. There is nothing we can do to help you, even though our hearts too bleed for the little prince. Perhaps. Yes, perhaps. We may fail, King Colifar. We may rouse false hopes and leave your spirit even more troubled than it is now, but there is a machine which rests in our flying bird, our spaceship machine. Well, the audio wave amplifier. Suppose we try it, Sebastian. There's just a chance. Audio wave detector. Your words fall on ears that do not comprehend. They cannot, Osir, for this is magic that reaches forward into time. Forward into the vast infinity of the future. But the machine, where am I speaking? Then it must be brought here at once. Listen to me, strangers, messenger of Ra and Osiris. Thrice the house of Korifar has been struck. The grave of the queen, my mother, has been defiled by grave robbers. I have but lately eluded death from a dagger in the dark. And now, my son, my little prince, if you find the prince, I will make the god offerings of electrum and gold, jewels and linen beyond compare. I will erect a temple Yes, to... yes, yes, Pharaoh, but we must not let the shadow of the sundial pass another segment. The machine must be brought here at once. <laughs> in which the little prince slept. And there, beyond the cedar doors where the guard was slain, I too conned his ear. But the prince is gone now. Why do you tarry here while his abducted 
darkness taken beyond our reach. It is here, O Pharaoh, with this magic device that the miracle must be performed. For it is in this very chamber that we shall hear the words of the conspirators. There is no sound here save the drone of your, your amplifier. Amplifier? Have you ever stood upon the banks of the river Nile, O Pharaoh, and tossed a pebble into the water? Yes, yes, many times. You've seen the waves which it produces move out in ever-widening circles. The waves become fainter and fainter until at last the naked eye cannot see them. Yes, yes. But the motion is still there. The invisible ripples keep spreading through the water, even until the great river flows into the sea. I do not understand. How shall this recall my son? The spoken word, O Pharaoh, like the pebble in the water, produces waves in the air which spread in ever-widening circles and finally become too weak to be heard by the naked ear. But this magic device, Qualifar, can give new strength to the waves and make them audible. Feast 
tonight and banquet. The little prince is saved. But tomorrow, tomorrow, vengeance Messengers of a god, listen to me. Your great bird lies in the fields of these other side, and I'll poise for flight. But before you depart, you must hear this. Three times have they struck at the house of Colifar. Three times they have failed. But next time... There will be no next time, O Pharaoh. You will destroy the plague upon your house with your own hands. How can I destroy an enemy I do not know? The enemy is known to me, Pharaoh. He is within your gates. He feasts with you. He sits at your banquet table and eats your food even as he plots your death. No, no, do not listen to that comment to your lips. Sebastian, have you gone mad? We're ready to leave. The ship's prepared. You'll ruin everything. Vizier. Yes, messenger of Ra. Drink the wine from the goblet the Pharaoh holds. The fruit of the grape is forbidden to Tukan, O son of Osiris. No, no, stranger. You are in error. The vizier Tukan is my trusted friend, my advisor. Then let him prove it by drinking the wine. Right. You see, he dare not call it far, for he knows that the wine is poison. Drink the wine, Tukan, my noble friend. Prove your innocence. Drink. No. No, I dare not. You know the penalty for treason. Drink from that goblet, Vizier, my friend, my noble counselor. No, no I cannot. Do not kill me. Do not kill me. I must uh, take him away. Remove him from my sight, and when he is dead, let no stone mark the place where his worthless soul is buried. Great heavens, Sebastian, I'm flawed. How did you do it? Do what? Spot that, that vizier as the poison. How did you know there was poison in the goblet? I saw the vizier put something in it. Yes, but how did you know it was poison? Uh, I'm an archaeologist, Wilson, a student of history. Don't you see? I knew there was a pharaoh called Colifar. I knew an attempt was made to poison him, and the attempt failed. So I kept my eyes open and spotted the vizier. I read all about it in a book. A book that won't be published until 5,000 years from now. sons of Osiris, who have rendered us much service with your feats of magic. These jewels and gold are but a small token of our gratitude. We must leave Kolefar. It is written in the stars. The gods grow impatient for our return. Already the wheels that turn our spaceship are impatient for flight. The bird is eager to rise. We find your great bird strange and exciting. What is the picture painted in bold colors upon the side? It is a symbol, Pharaoh. It is called the Sphinx. Sphinx? Sphinx? Uh, that is an Egyptian word. I must examine the picture more closely. Strange. Most strange. That bird comes to the garden of the gods and rests upon the sands of Giza. And yet, look upon the picture you call the Sphinx. Crouching lion, but the head... The head, my lord, is your head. The features, the face, it's your face. It is an omen, an omen from the gods. I, Kolifa, decree that upon this very spot in Giza, which guards the river Nile, there shall be carved from this mountain a statue, complete in every detail, an exact copy of the picture upon the stranger's great bird. The head shall be my head, the eyes brooding and distant, and the body that of a crouching lion. The statue shall be called the Sphinx.
unusual story of science fiction on 2000 Plus. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. From Hollywood, Lorene Tuttle in The Unexpected. The Unexpected. The Unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Now, Laureen Tuttle, outstanding radio and screen star in Understudy, a drama of the unexpected. All right, Stephen, you've won. You've convinced them all that I'm insane. They wouldn't have believed you if it weren't true, would they, Stephen? And I'll tell you a secret. I think they're right. I think I am mad. Because if I weren't, I'd never be able to take this penknife and slash your precious oil paintings, would I? <laughs> now, now you know what insanity means. It means I can destroy everything. Everything that my hand touches. Your books. Your lamps. Your antique mirrors. And the day will come when I can destroy life itself. Aren't you happy, Stephen, now that I'm really insane? <laughs> really, really mad? <laughs> and the great Marion Danton has finished another performance. How many curtain calls will she take tonight? Six? Seven? Eight? Eight curtain calls for a cheap, phony job of acting that a second-rate amateur would be ashamed of. But because she's Marion Danton, they'll clap until their hands are raw. And just because I'm an understudy, they'll never know how that part could be played. But I won't get the chance. No, I'll stand here in the wings, night after night, waiting for the opportunity that will never come. Never. Unless... Unless something should happen to the great star. A 
unless Mary and Danton should become ill. Or better yet, have an accident. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, Joyce! Oh, Joyce, could you come into my dressing room, please? Cross, Miss Danton. Oh, and, and close the door, darling, or the place will be simply swarming with autograph hounds. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm simply exhausted. You have no idea what a performance like that takes out of one. No. No, I really haven't. That's why I asked you to come in. My maid's been called out of town, and I wonder if you'd be good enough to help me into my street things. Uh, now, I know you don't have to do it, but uh, being my understudy, I didn't think you'd mind. Mm -hmm. After all, you haven't done any acting to earn your salary, and it doesn't seem likely you will, does it, darling? I really have no idea. Now, don't tell me you're one of those understudies who secretly prays that something might happen to the star. Oh, you aren't like that, are you, Joyce? No, no, Miss Danton, I'm not like that. <laughs> well, I'm so glad to hear it. Oh, darling, uh, darling, just uh, unzip me and give me those stockings over on the chair, and uh, and then I'll want that blue and white in the closet. You know where it is. So I'm a dresser now, handing Miss Danton her street clothes, helping her into her coat, and smiling sweetly as she leaves the theater. Good night, darling, and thanks for being such a willing understudy. You're welcome, Miss Danton. Good night. Hey, you, look out! What? Are you hitting a piece of scenery? Watch where you're going. Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to know better than to walk around a stage when we're setting up scenery. I guess I should. I was thinking about something else. Hey, don't I know you? Well, I don't know, do you? Well, sure. You're Joyce Michaels. I was a stagehand up at Lake Leonard that summer you were in the company. Oh, oh, yes, yes, I remember. My name's Ned Carpenter. Well, hello, Ned. Nice to see you again. Are you with this show? Well, in a way, I'm understudying Danton. Oh, I see. I just started to work as a replacement. I'm handling the stuff up there in the flies. Too bad the job won't last. Well, what do you mean? Well, haven't you heard? Miss Danton's going back to Hollywood to do a picture. Show closes next Saturday. Why, didn't you know that? No, I hadn't heard. So the great Danton is giving up the theater again. How nice for her. Of course, the show will close in mid-season. The whole company will be out of work. And I've lost my one real chance to prove that I'm an actress. That doesn't matter to anyone but me. And there's nothing I can do about it, is there? How could I force fate? How could I keep Danton from going on for just one night? Just one little night. How? Ned? Yeah? Uh, you said you were working in the scenery up there over the stage. Yeah, that's right. Are you up there while the play is going on? Sure. <laughs> it must be funny to be able to look down and watch a show. Can you see the actors? Yeah, the tops of their heads, anyway. Of course, you don't get much of an idea of what the play's about. No, I suppose you don't. Anyway, I'm too busy to pay much attention. I'm all alone up in the flies. I see. Hey, why don't I let you take me home? Well, why don't you? Well, since you're in the fifth, Ned, I think I'll give in. <laughs> Can I give you another drink? Why not? <laughs> That's what I say. Why not? Hey, uh, you've changed your dress. You weren't wearing that thing before. Oh, well, I like to be comfortable. <laughs> yeah, I like you to be comfortable. Yeah, I'm sorry I haven't been on the show before. We could have spent a lot of time together. Yeah. But I suppose you'll still be in town. No, Ned. Not when the play closes. Oh? No, I'm broke. I'll have to give it up and go home. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, I don't care so much for myself, but all the rest of the cast and the crew, they'll be out of work, too. Yeah. Well, that's show business. Yeah, but this time it isn't fair, Ned, because the show could continue. I know every line of Danton's part, and I could play it so much better than she ever could. And, well, the play could run on without her. Oh, I believe you, Joyce. You don't have to convince me. Oh, if I just got the chance to play it once, they wouldn't have to close the show. And everybody would know how good I was. Oh, but you can't play it unless something happens to Danton. Well, how about you? Me? You mean... Sure. You're up over her head. Suppose something fell just as she was making her first entrance. It wouldn't have to hit her or anything, just 
maybe frighten her a little bit and get her so nervous she couldn't go on. And then... Yeah. Yeah, I see. Oh, darling, do you? Do you really? They couldn't blame you. It, it would be an accident. I'd play the part and we could go on being together. You'll do it tomorrow night, won't you, Ned? Just as she makes her entrance down that flight of stairs. A sandbag or anything can fall and then... And then I'll play the part. Oh, Ned, what a performance I'll be. Well, if it didn't work, I'd be out of a job next week anyway. Oh, you're wonderful, darling. You're wonderful. And you know something. What? I'm really glad you're such an agreeable guy. I'm going to try to follow your example. <laughs> audience sits back, shuffling programs, waiting for another Marion Danton performance. But Miss Danton will be indisposed and able to appear, replaced by an unknown. But by the time the show ends, they'll be applauding, giving curtain calls to a new star, to Joyce Michaels. 8.32, Danton sits in her dressing room. She rubs an extra dab of grease paint into the circles under her eyes, gives a silent jerk to her costume, and walks toward the wings. 8.35. Danton's walking up the backstage steps and across the platform to her entrance. Now she stands there waiting for her cue. She can't see Ned, far above her in the flies. Can't know the danger that lurks over her head. Ned looks down, just able to make out the white cap she's wearing. And then he raises his hand and something whips past Danton's face, falling, crashing downward. <laughs> Not badly, but she can't go on. Now, now they're remembering me. Mr. Beaton, the stage manager, is walking toward my dressing room. In just a moment, he'll knock on the door. And my lucky break will step in and tell me to get ready for my first night on Broadway. Come in. Miss Michaels, Miss Danton's been in an accident. Oh? You'll have to get into the costume right away. We'll hold the show for you. Oh, and Joyce, you will be able to play the part, won't you? Oh, yes, Mr. Beaton, I'll be able to play the part. Don't worry, I won't let you down. I can play the part very well. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, good luck. Oh, this is it. My big night has come at last. Thanks to Ned. <laughs> You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. Now for the surprising conclusion of Understudy, a Hamilton Whitney production starring Miss Lorene Tuttle, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and directed by Frank K. Danzig. That's my cue. Now I smile, open the door, and step on stage for my first entrance. Miss Michaels, Miss Michaels, are you all right? Miss Michaels, oh, good heavens. How could that stupid stagehand have been so clumsy? Uh, ring down the curtain, someone. Oh, this is simply too much. First, Danton gets hurt in an automobile accident, and now Miss Michaels has been hit by a sandbag. Oh, well, the poor girl probably wouldn't have been very good in the part anyway. She's only an understudy.
understudy starred Miss Lorene Tuttle. Listen soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Unit 99 to KMA 907. Unit 99, Sergeant Meredith, 909, in service, on the air. This is Sergeant Dan Meredith of Unit 99 at headquarters, Police Department, City of Sacramento, California. My detail is to ride in Unit 99, our tape recorder equipped radio car, and to respond whenever the dispatcher transmits a signal to one of our other units on duty somewhere in the city. At the scene, we make the recording for this program. Now, to tell you more about Unit 99, here is our chief, James V. Hicks, Sacramento Police. We have provided Unit 99 of the Sacramento Police Department, the tape recorder it carries, and the officer in charge, Sergeant Meredith, so that you, who depend on your police for protection, can hear them in action, on duty. And what you hear on this radio program is real. No question about it. The suspects are real. The victims are real. Bear this in mind as you hear these cases. Now to Unit 99 and Sergeant Dan Meredith on duty. Unit 3. 214 L. Lincoln. A man threatening a woman with a gun. Code 2. Check 3 came in on 7. Unit 3 is going to check out a man with a gun on Lower L Street. Let's go along. It's here. Evidently inside. Let's go in. They're in the back. Hello, Peyton. He just uh, told the lady. told me that uh, I come in, you know, and when I come in, she said she was all nervous and shaking, you know. I said, uh, what's the matter with her? He said she was sitting down there. And this guy come in, but he was sitting down here, he showed a gun, he says, uh, don't get nervous, just relax. See the little And uh, he says, because uh, I show you something, he got a gun. So she just stood there, she didn't know how to use a telephone, so. <laughs> so when I come back, she told me about it. Well, and and what, did he, what did he tell you, that he was looking for a woman and a man who had robbed him of his money? Uh -huh. How old was the man? He asked me my age, I was 100 years old. He asked you your age? Uh -huh. 
Me hicieron mi Cuando he cambió en ahí, stand up, y dice, sit down, sit down, relax, relax. ¿Y le No. He said, I'm looking for women, robber my money, but he said, no be nervous. He said, I show you. He got a gun in here. Now, what does he look like? A skinny man, a skinny, got a, got a khaki shirt. Khaki shirt. And jean pants. Jean pants. And got a cap. A cap. A cap, something like that, a peak on it. Peak on it. Yeah. And how old did you say he was? Maybe 20, maybe 25. Mexican boy? No, it's not American. Okay, we'll go take a look and see if we can find him. Stop the car, Dan. Let's take a look at that guy. Khaki shirt, black jeans, bill cap, skinny, and white man. Where is he? Right there, just going in the gold nugget. Well, let's go in there. There he is, Guthrie's got him. This man? This is a man, he has a gun in his belt. Yeah. <clears throat> Looks like an old style frontier model. Loaded? Is it loaded? Yes, it's loaded. Side uh, loading, rear holder. Let's see it, Bruce. What are you doing with this loaded gun on you? I didn't feel like leaving in my car, officer. Leaving in your car? What's that? You're looking for some woman, aren't you? Well, I was looking around to see where the woman was at. Just broke it open, fully loaded. Do you have a permit to carry this gun? No, I haven't. Well, why are you carrying it? Like I stated, I don't feel like leaving it in the car. My car well, is not a, here on, on the streets. So. That's not a very good excuse. Want the other one? No, we'll keep this as evidence. All right, let's go. We're going to take this fellow in and have the victims, the people he approached, come in and identify him. You want to tell us anything more about this gun? I don't want to leave it. Didn't want to leave it in my car. My car has been sitting on the street since about three o'clock this afternoon. I went to a show. The gun was sitting in the car at the time. Yeah. After it got dark, I got kind of leery about leaving it in there because windows can be broke. Sure, I can lock the car. In fact, it's locked right now. Well, don't you think it'd be a lot better to keep it in your car than have it on your person like you did tonight and picked up with it on you? Well. I'll admit I was taking a chance of getting myself in trouble by carrying it, yes. Didn't you go into a bar down here in 2nd and 3rd on L Street and confront some barmaid down there? Um, 2nd. That's right, over here, south of the border. Now tell us was your story. A, was it an elderly woman That's or right. a young one? Elderly Mexican woman. All right, at that place there, yes, I admit going in there. I was in one other one and I asked about a woman. Now, why did you want a woman? I'm trying to find out what the woman is doing right now. What woman? I don't know what her last name is. All I know is her first name. Uh-huh. She was living with a fellow out here on uh, the old Marysville Road. He's treated her sort of like a slave, in other words. Every time that uh, she gets a few drinks or something goes wrong, he brings her around to town here and dumps her. That's a shift for herself. He's supposed to be a body and fender man. Well, and uh, Are you looking for him tonight? Not in particular. I was trying to find her and trying to get her off the places here in town. She's, yes, she's a heavy drinker. Now, did I'll you think that. that you'd need a gun tonight to get her off these streets? Not her, no. I wouldn't ask. Who were you after? I'm going to tell you now, and I'll tell anybody, I don't care who it is. The man that has been treating this woman like he has been treating her. He has beat me out of money, beat everybody that he knows out of money. He's a guy that... Uh, the DA right now doesn't have too much use for him. So you were looking with it for him with this he gun? He has a gun, too. Is that the reason why you were carrying this? No, that's not the reason I was carrying it. The reason I was carrying that was, like I told you, to keep it from being sitting in my car. 
Well, I, I guess know, this is... It looks is... bad for me. It is bad for me. Puts me in a bad spot. I've got a chance of going up the river for a while. I know that. What kind I'll of tell you why. What kind of a record do you have? I'm a one-time loser. For what? McNeil Island. Okay. Federal, federal offense? From the territory of Alaska. What was the charge? Illegal entry into a dwelling. Uh-huh. Anchorage, Alaska. So that makes you an ex-con with a gun, don't it? That's right, sir. I know what I'm facing right now. All right, right? Uh, do you want to tell us anything further about the purpose of carrying this gun? Other than what you've told us already, I don't think you're actually telling us the truth. You want to stick to your story? The only thing else was that if this other guy had been around and given me a bad time and drawn a gun on me, I'd have shot him. You would have killed him? Not actually killed him, I'd have shot him. Well, that's... Because he's made the boast. Then anybody cross him and he's going to kill him. So you're more or less going to take advantage of the situation. If you see him first, you're going to shoot him. Is that right? Not unless he draws on me. Uh, you see, is, is that your car? That's right. You the legal and the registered owner? I have the pink on it, but man, I still owe him money on it. I want to check through it, Bruce, see if there's anything else in yeah, there. Yeah, good idea, Dad. Uh, Looks like you found the holster, Dan. Yeah, I found the holster on and the belt on the front seat there. You certainly know better than to carry a gun on your person the uh, next That's time. That's right, Sergeant. I know better. That's why I have no complaints. Going out looking no for a guy with a gun is a good way of getting into trouble. I know squawks at all. Find anything else, Dan? Do you have another car? No. Not at the present time. There's a set of license plates in there for a 51 Ford. It's in uh, North Hollywood, California. That's right. It's registered to you. I haven't you. Uh, sent the plates or title back to the people that has the car in their possession at the present time. Well, why didn't you? Well, it was kind of a shady deal that they got the car to begin with. They still have possession of the car? They have possession of it, yes. Who has the pink slip? The pink slip is right there with the plates. I see in the back seat, too, the... Tools back there look like burglar tools. What kind of work do you burglar do? Tools. That's right. What kind of work do you do? I'm a mechanic. What kind of a mechanic? Automotive and diesel. What kind of tools are those in the back of the car? In the trunk? In the back, on the floor, in the back seat. In the back seat, those most are tire tools. A pair of pliers? A pair of pliers, that's a pair of side cutters, I believe. Fire cutters. Sounds like this man could be a pretty good burglar, too. Could somebody tell him he'll find a movement of a watch laying on the front seat there in a cigarette case with some uh, other odds and ends of watch parts? What are they there for? I bought the watch today. The other parts I've had for quite some time. Who'd you I buy the watch from? Down here on uh, K Street, this uh, money to loan. You said you, there's watch works laying in there. Well, there's a watch movement. Waltham watch movement. And that's all you bought was just the movement? That's what I bought today. The other stuff I've had for quite some time. Isn't it a little unusual to buy a watch movement in one of these pawn shops? Not for me. In fact, is in my right shirt pocket, I have a seven jewel watch that I bought from there. Down in here in my watch pocket, I have a Hampton pocket watch. Well, that part of it is fine. I can understand you're buying a whole watch, but not just the movement. It's a hobby of mine of working on watches. <laughs> well, those watches will have to be checked out by the detectives as far as numbers are concerned. I think, as you said a while ago, Dan, it would be a good idea to turn him over to the detective bureau and let them check into it further. Well, what's the charge there, Bruce, that is on the book against this guy? Well, we booked the man, ex-con with a gun, which is specifically 12025 of the Penal Code, Deadly Weapons Act. We have already booked him. He's been placed in the cell. We booked the gun as evidence, the holster that you found in the car. The bullets and the gun have been marked so that it can be identified in court. Two watches that he had on his person were also booked as evidence. 
Now we're going to take this information down and give it to the detective bureau, and they'll follow through from there. I imagine that they'll go down and search that car more thoroughly than you had time to do, yeah. and also check up on this man's record and check into those possible burglar tools. The Good Samaritan with a gun told an odd and unbelievable story, but the outstanding feature was that he was an ex-convict in possession of a gun. Investigation revealed nothing criminal in connection with the watches or tools, and he was sentenced to six months in the county jail on the gun charge. Well, there's a traffic unit ahead, about a half a block. We're stopped at a red light right now. As Officer Bender and McAdams, they have somebody out in the street there. Let's check with them, see what it is. Hello, Mac. Uh, what do you have here? Well, uh, Danny, we just got a call of a uh, of an accident down here with a possible 502 in it, and uh, we have the man here. Oh, right in front there. Yeah, and this uh, this nice blue car, see, and uh, well, what he's done, he's he's hit this these two cars parked over here. He's 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 hit one and knocked it up onto the curbing and slammed it up into the, another one. Oh, is that uh, meter box knocked over too? Yeah, I just knocked that right down That's and. Uh, not too much damage over there. They're considerable to the second car, not very much to the first car. Then uh, what he did, he just he uh, drove over here. So I guess it was about 130 feet and where his motor died. Otherwise, I suppose he'd have just kept right on going. Did you see this? No, we have uh, witnesses, though. That, uh, we have their names and they've given them to oh, us. Did they stop you on it? Yeah. I see. Uh, anybody hurt? No, he's... Like most of them, they're not hurting these. It's, I see. Yeah, I think he's. I think he might go uh, go 502 on this. Would, would you mind taking him in for no, us? No, I'd be glad to. Uh, we'll beat you in the station there. If you just as soon as you get through your reporting here, well, I'll check with you in there. Yeah, about five or ten minutes. Okay. Uh, what's this going to look like now? What are the charges going to be? Well, uh, I'd say it was, it's a definite, uh, definite hit and run. 483, the vehicle code, and. Uh, from the way he looks to me right now, I'd say drunk driving, 502. Well, get in here. Yeah. Hello, boy. Right in the back seat. That's it. Yeah. Well, you better get your feet in there. That's it. Okay. Before I get done, I'm going to cause you some trouble, see? Oh, we haven't done anything to you. That's all right. I'm not mad at you. That's a boy. Huh? You, you know I'm going to get uh, and cause you trouble? I'm going to get Bart Kavanaugh. I'm, I'm going to cause you some trouble, see? Well, uh, I live here in Sacramento, see? Yes, that's true. I'm going to get Bart Kavanaugh, and he's a good friend of mine, and I'm going to get... Uh, uh, you have taken my car in, and uh, you have taken me in here. You know what I mean? And I am going to cause you some trouble before I'm over. Well, why do you want to cause us trouble? Why? Well, why would I cause you trouble? Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think I think you're wrong, see? Why do you think we're wrong? Well, uh, that's all right. You're going to take me in tonight. That's all right. Before I get done tomorrow with you, I'm going to I'm going to get Bart Kavanaugh, and I'm going to cause you some trouble, see? Well, that's your privilege. Well, that's you my privilege. That, that's right. If you want to do that, that's you go right. right that's, that, that's what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? All right. Uh, tonight uh, don't mean nothing. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You're going to take me in tonight, and as as a police character. And, and this but when I get uh, done with you tomorrow, I'm going to find out who you are. I'm going to find out what you did to me, and I'm going to get Bart Kavanaugh, and he's a good friend of mine, and. Uh, well, what did I do to you? You didn't do nothing to me. You didn't do nothing to me. Probably. You'll find out before you get down tomorrow night. Just, uh, just, just because you took me in tonight. You just wait. You just wait till I get all down tomorrow. Okay. That's all right. You warm enough back there? Yeah. Sure. I'm fine. You know, this man's got my automobile, and I haven't got my automobile, you know what I mean? Well, they're taking care of it for That's you. right, that's right. I'm going to find out what happened to my automobile, you know. 
Well, you struck that parked car back That's there. right, that's right, that's right. Do you, remember, you remember doing that? No, I'm not mad at nobody. You remember hitting the parked car well, back Well, sure. Yeah, sure. How much uh, drinking did you do tonight? About? Well, I did pretty good drinking. Uh, how many did you have about? Well, I probably 15, 20 drinks. I see. I'm not mad at nobody. Whis whiskey or beer? Well, I've, I've, I've been drinking whiskey all night. Well, here we are. This emergency hospital. I say, I'm not mad at nobody. What's wrong? Here we are. Possible five. Possible five or two. Right in here. Okay. Very possible. <laughs> Do you have diabetes? No. Have you taken any medicine today? No. Have you been drinking? I think I had a few drinks, yeah. What were you drinking? Uh, well, I think I've been drinking uh, uh, four or five, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Highballs? Highballs. Whiskey? Yeah, whiskey. You had four or five drinks of whiskey? Four or five drinks of whiskey. I thought you told me you had 10 or 15 drinks. Oh, maybe I did. Did I say? Maybe well, I did have 10 or 15 drinks. Well, which would you rather say? I said uh, 10 or 15 drinks of whiskey. 10 or 15? Yeah. Okay. In the... Uh, when When was that? What period? Tonight. Tonight. Starting when? Uh... Eight or nine o'clock tonight. Mm -hmm. Until when? Eight or, eight or nine o'clock tonight. Until when? When did you have your last drink? About uh, eight or nine o'clock tonight. And when did you start drinking then? About eight or nine o'clock tonight. Well, when did you stop drinking? Eight or nine o'clock tonight. You had some quick ones then? Yeah. Do you have any physical disabilities? Not that I know of. You haven't had a drink since 9 o'clock? Yes, I have. Oh, well, then yeah. when did you have your last drink, would you say? About 10 o'clock tonight. Oh, I see. All right. Now, we'd like you to get up and uh, perform for us a little bit. Do you want to walk across the room there? Yeah, I will. Now, this way. Now, walk around the bed. Okay. Okay, that's fine. All right, now just stand up straight there, please, and face me. Now put your feet together. Your toes together, too. Well, can I put my toes together that way? That's fine. Okay. Now close your eyes. Close them tight. Close your eyes. Okay, that's fine. All right, now pick up, uh, open your eyes. Pick up your right foot and stand on your left foot. My right foot. Pick up your right foot and stand on your left foot. Well, I probably am a little done. <laughs> well, see it. Let's see you try. Pick up your right foot and stand on your left foot. Oh. My right foot. Right foot. That, that, that's the foot. Right. We'll do it one way and then do it the other way. I still say I'm a little done. Well, no, I want you to try to do this now. Well, I'm a little done. I know that. Pick up your foot. Well, I'm, oh, I'm a little done. You can sit down. Okay. Did you tell the doctor you were not in an accident tonight? No. You you weren't. No. Was that? Yes, you were. Was that? Yes. Where? On L Street between 11th and 12th. You struck a parked car. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't. I, I don't know that. I said I don't want to hurt nobody, and I don't want to hurt nobody. That's right. But you didn't hurt anybody. You just struck a parked car. What does your report show on that uh, possible five or two? Well, my conclusions were that the man was obviously under the influence of alcohol and should not be driving. I doubt that there is a police officer who has not, at some time, been threatened with trouble or loss of his badge for doing his duty. In modern departments, of course, such threats are ridiculous, and the men are fully aware of it. In this case, the self-styled personal friend of the city manager paid a drunk driving fine of $263 and $105 for hit-run driving. 
This is Unit 99, presented in cooperation with Station KFBK in Sacramento, California. These on-the-scene tape recordings were provided by the Sacramento Police Department and were made on duty by Sergeant Dan Meredith in Unit 99. Your host is Chief James V. Hicks of the Sacramento Police Department. KMA 907, Sacramento Police. Unit 99. Unit 99 is a presentation of the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Unsolved Mysteries. Act of Providence is a phrase so carelessly used today as to have almost lost the very significance of its meaning. But at no time has it held so much meaning as in the true historical case of the Crown versus John Applegate, as reported in the Newgate calendar. Thank you. 
scene is the Sessions Court of the County of Middlesex. The courthouse fronts the village green, and the holiday attire of the villagers, the laughter of children, and the entire atmosphere is one of gaiety. A gaiety almost beyond our comprehension, since the occasion of it is a murder trial. Laughter gives way to excited chattering. Dame rumor has it that the jury have reached a verdict. Justice Selden, white-wigged and black-gowned, mounts to the bench. A small square of black cloth lying ready to the session's clerk's hand rivets the prisoner's eyes as he's marched to the dock. Hear ye, hear ye, the second court of the county of Middlesex now in session. Chief Justice Selden presiding. All stand while the justice and the jury have taken their places in the court. Know ye then, John Applegate, that ye must face the jury and prepare to abide by their verdict. How say ye, gentlemen of the jury, ye find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? We find the prisoner, John Applegate, guilty of murder, as charged in the indictment read by the Sessions clerk. John Applegate, ye have heard the verdict returned against ye. Have ye anything to say why the sentence of death should not be carried out upon ye? You? Your Honor, I'm not guilty. I swear it. I was never at the Rose and Thistle Tavern... I never saw the murdered man. I, I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. Five men and four women have identified you. You say that you spent the night in company with a gentleman of quality. But no gentleman, either quality or of the common, has come forward to, to bear your witness. I don't know who he was, Your Honor. I never saw him before. I, I only know I, I'm not guilty. John Applegate, hear this. The sentence of death is to be carried out upon you. You shall be taken from this place to the place whence you came, and thence to the public gallows, where you shall be hanged by the neck until you be dead, dead, dead. And may Almighty God have mercy upon your soul. Amen. In those days, public hangings were regarded as a legitimate entertainment, and the old men loitering around the gallows being erected by the public executioner and his assistants discussed previous hangings they had attended. In his dank cell, John Applegate prays incessantly for deliverance. His stuttered broken sentences punctuated by the dull, ominous thud of the carpenter's hammers as the gallows grows stick by stick, beam by beam, and nail by nail. Miss Tingley, sir, it's time to get up. Eh? Uh, eh? Uh, what's that? Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh, time to get up. Odds fish. It's still dark. You said to call you, sir, at three o'clock. I did, did I? So? I don't remember. Uh, where am I going that I must needs rise this early? I don't know, sir. But you did say, sir, that you had to get to the village early. Uh, so be it. So be it. Uh, if I did, I did. Uh, but I swear that it's beyond me. I don't know a thing of it. Katie. Katie, have you waked the master? Yes, Miss Garrett. He'll be down directly. I don't know what's wrong with him, Miss Katie. What do you mean, wench? He swears that he doesn't remember giving us orders to wake him early. Ah, he's half asleep yet. Wait till he wakes, he'll remember. Come now, hurry and set table. Yes, Miss Janet. And remember, wench, though breakfast be in the middle of the night, pewter must be cleaned properly. Yes, Miss Janet. I swear, I don't know what this is all about. I never said that I wanted to be about at three in the morning. Aye, you've forgotten, sir. He came to my room last night, waked me and said, Janet, I want breakfast at three. I must needs get to the village before nine. Yes, but I have nothing to go to the village for. You, Katie, when did I tell you that I must rise early? Last night, sir. Late it was, sir. Oh, I was fast asleep and you came and knocked on the door. He said, uh, Katie, I must be up and about at dawn. I'll break fast at three. You've forgotten, sir. Come, master. Breakfast is ready. Odds fish, I haven't forgotten it. I, I tell you, I, I've not to go to the village today. Horse be saddled and ready, master. What's this? You too, Jacob? Me too. 
What ails ye, master? Did I waken you two in the middle of the night and tell you that I must be to the village this morning early? Indeed, and that you did, master. Don't you remember? I told you it was foolish, like, to be coming down to the stables in the cold of the night with no coat on your back. Arts fish. Uh, it seems that I must have done. Yes, master. You said that the best horse must be saddled and ready for the road at three. Come, master. You're not eating enough. If you're for the road, you can set saddle better on a full stomach. Uh, Jacob. Yes, master. I never go to the stables in my slippers. No, master. Then if I did last night, uh, there will be traces on the slippers. Bring them to me. Yes, master. It seems that I must, whether I will or not, be off to the village. I would that the good Lord would tell me what for, for I have no idea. Aye, but you'll remember, Master, when you're on your way. Sounds. You act as if my memory were leaving me. The slippers, Master. And clean as a hound's tooth and dry as a bone, I'll be bound. Yes, Master. This smacks of witchery. Uh, but I'll go. I'll go to the village and see what befalls. Come, Bess. Get up. Down the dark highway rides Kingsley. A strange feeling, half fear, half anxiety drives him on. And ever and anon, he mutters to himself about the foolishness of the journey. Three hours later, the horse's pace slackens. The horse knows that around the next turn is the toll bridge, which he must cross to complete the journey to the village. What a fool I am. The bridge will be closed. Lock tight, and old Jerry doesn't open it till nigh on nine. Mr. Kingsley, sir! Mr. Kingsley, is that you? Jerry! Jerry! Is it you, Jerry? Right on, master. Right on. The bridge is open. <sighs> there he is. There he is. Riding the horse. The man, the gentleman of quality I was with. The night of the murder. Oh, praise to God, sir. You saved my life. And so John Applegate did not hang. Mr. Kingsley gentleman of quality identified Applegate as having been with him far from the scene of the murder. So firmly did Applegate believe that Providence had intervened because of his prayers that he forsook the world and retired to a monastery, where until his death he was called Brother Jonathan, the man whom God had saved. Out of deference to people who may still be living, character names in some of these unsolved mysteries have been changed. Inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and characters have been taken. In just a moment, you will hear a solution to the toll bridge mystery. Gentlemen, the solution for which you have been waiting. Do you mean to say that you have an explanation of the toll bridge mystery? I believe I have. Of course, you understand that I'm not an authority on the subject, but in consulting writings by world authorities, such as Manhood of Humanity by Alfred Korsibsky, the files of the London Society of Psychical Research, and others, I've formed a definite opinion. I see. 
In the first place, further investigation of the mystery disclosed that the toll bridge keeper, old Jerry, had been uh, warned about 12 the night before by Mr. Kingsley and told that he would be wanting to cross the bridge about 7 in the morning. But didn't the toll gate keeper think that strange? I mean the idea of Mr. Kingsley riding that three-hour trip at midnight and turning around to ride home again? Well, naturally he thought it strange, but the very strangeness of it provides the solution. I, uh, I don't quite follow you. Well, don't you see? It was impossible for Mr. Kingsley to be at the toll gate at midnight and at the same time waken Janet, Katie, and Jacob, the groom. Yes, of course. Kingsley couldn't have got home till three. It is accepted by many, and I think justifiably, that wishing precedes thinking, and wish forms precede thought forms. Now, Applegate, lying in jail and knowing that he was innocent, was wishing to be saved. That's natural. Applegate knew that the only person who could save him was the, as he said, gentleman of quality who would provide him with his alibi. He concentrated his every thought, his every wish on Kingsley, although he didn't know him. Since mind is everywhere, Kingsley's subconscious was aware of the dire straits of the man Applegate. And these thoughts, in turn, were directed toward the persons necessary to assist Kingsley in getting to the village. In other words, Applegate's direct thoughts were taken into partnership with Kingsley's subconscious thoughts. And Katie, Janet, Jacob, and the toll bridge keeper were awakened by the strength of these thought waves, rather than by the physical appearance of Kingsley himself. Yes. And you must not lose sight of the fact that neither Katie, Janet, Jacob, or the toll bridge keeper had any suspicion that there was an execution impending, much less that their friend and master, Mr. Kingsley, had anything whatever to do with it. That is the final proof that the entire thing hinged on thoughts rather than anything physical. <laughs> young and intelligent and highly trained. He is Eric Banfeld, shipwrecked on a long-forgotten colony world where brawn and brute strength are more valued than knowledge, physically untrained and emotionally unprepared in the barest skills of survival, he seems compelled to spend a short and very unpleasant life as a half-naked savage worked like a beast of burden on a world so sunk into barbarism that its inhabitants have no concept of the wheel. It's either that or die. His only possible chance, his only hope of becoming one with the folk is to become a singer or teller of stories. But in Eric Banfeld's case, he must be a singer of lies. Singer of Lies, a science fantasy novel by Michael R. Collings. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weird Circle In this cave by the restless sea we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bellkeeper, toll the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the Weird Circle. Out of the 
past. Phantoms of a world gone by speak again their immortal tale, The Man Without a Country. Philip Nolan, officer in the pay of the United States Army. I have so many memories of Philip Nolan. I think I was the only friend he ever had. I think I was the only man who really knew him during his whole incredible lifetime. I knew what he suffered when his boy's dream turned into a living nightmare. And it all started so innocently. Philip Nolan was 20 years old or so, and he'd conceived a bad case of hero worship for Aaron Burr. Burr. Philip and I were stationed together at camp. We were in the Legion of the West. And it was then, in the year 1805, that we had become close friends. I remember one particular evening that Philip and I were strolling down the barracks together. Philip was excited. Hey, you'll imagine. Burr will be here. Here at this camp tonight. And I've permission to see him. That's a man for you, Hale. A real man. You know what they say about him? He's going to break away from the United States. And he's got an army behind him, an empire before him. Conquer Mexico. You know what? I'd enlist behind Aaron Burr and follow him straight to hell if it were necessary. I wonder if I could enlist with him. I'll ask him tonight. That's what I'll do. Tonight. That was a great day for poor Nolan. As soon as Burr arrived, he sent for Nolan. Nolan responded immediately. And he ran from barracks all the way to the great man's room. He knocked on the door. And in a frenzy of impatience, waited. He didn't know it then, but he was waiting for a living death. A living death. Mr. Nolan. Well, sir, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Mr. Burr, I've... I've written you repeatedly... Time and time again, I thought when you didn't answer, you'd, you'd forgotten me. Forgotten you? Indeed, no. Come in, boy. No, I haven't forgotten you. Nolan, I need you. I have some great plans for you. For me, Mr. Burr? Plans for me? Yes, indeed. Sir, sir, is it true what they say? Well, Nolan, that depends on what they say. You can tell me that. You, uh, you're starting a new army? You're out for empire to set yourself up over Mexico and... Ah. So they've gathered that much, have they? Well, Nolan, don't spread that rumor around. But between you and me... You and me? Oh, Mr. Burr, I... Sir, Nolan, I... you're a good man. How would you like to take me out in your skiff and show me the cane break? Or a cottonwood tree. I've always been interested in the terrain in these parts. Interested? Or uh, is this terrain part of your plan too, Mr. Burr? Well, we'll talk about that in your skiff. Time enough out there, Nolan. Yes, there was time enough to talk about a lot of things in the skiff. By the time that sail was over, poor Nolan was enlisted in Aaron Burr's scheme, body and soul. What that scheme was, I never knew, nor does anybody else. But that's not important now. It fell through, and every man of that group was arrested. Nolan was tried for treason. The big fellows, the ringleaders, escaped, but not Nolan. Nolan was taken before a military court. Old Colonel Morgan was presiding. Hours had passed, and the evidence against Nolan was piling up. His own commanding officer was saying... Nolan, do you deny that you are a traitor to the United States? Mr. Nolan, can you deny that you agreed to march anywhere at any time under the command of the traitorous Aaron Burr, even if he had commanded you to march against your own country, to march against the United States? No, I don't deny it. Mr. Nolan... As presiding judge, I want to ask one question before the gentlemen of this court will judge you. Have you anything to say in defense of yourself? 
Can you prove that you have always been faithful to the United States of America? Damn the United States! I wish I may never hear of the United States again! Yes, Nolan said, damn the United States. He had no way of realizing the consequences. I'm not trying to justify Nolan. I'm just saying that the United States wasn't a reality to him. The only thing he cared about was Burr, Aaron Burr. So he said, damn the United States. Old Colonel Morgan called the court into his private chamber and returned in 15 minutes with a face white as a sheet. He just stood and stared at Nolan. And then, with his voice quaking, Philip Nolan, hear the sentence. The court has decided, subject to the approval of the president, Mr. Jefferson, that you never hear the name of the United States again. Ha! <laughs> Mr. Marshall, take the prisoner to New Orleans in an armed boat and deliver him to Captain Shaw of the Nautilus. See that no one mentions the name of the United States to the prisoner. Make my respects to Captain Shaw and request him to carry out my orders. He will receive written orders from Washington to explain this in detail. The court is adjourned. I don't care, Colonel Morgan. I tell you, I don't care. I'd say the same thing over and over again. Damn the United States. Damn the United States. Nolan was taken to New Orleans and placed on board the Nautilus. The ship set out for sea and traveled from New Orleans to the North American coast. It was at dock there that Captain Shaw received intelligence of the proceedings by mail. On board ship that evening, they were docked in the harbor... Captain Shaw explained it to Nolan. Nolan was still the swaggering youngster then, as the old captain related. Well, Mr. Nolan, the word has come through from your former country's capital. From Washington? Yes, Mr. Nolan. Well, what is the happy word? You are a man without a country, Mr. Nolan. Without a country? The court has sentenced you to have your wish fulfilled. You will never hear of your country again. You will live on board ship for the rest of your life. You may wear whatever uniform you wish. Naturally, my own uniform. The buttons will have to be changed for plain buttons. Well, why is that, sir? There is the insignia of the... of your ex-country on the buttons. What? I see. You will remain under guard, of course, to prevent your escape. Naturally. But otherwise, you will have the freedom of the ship. And believe me, Mr. Nolan... You will not be exposed to any kind of indignity. Thank you, Captain. Thank you very much. And so it was that the man without a country sailed the seven seas. He never stayed on one boat for more than a year. He went from ship to ship. And it was ten years later that he was again shipping out on the Nautilus. He was shipping out of England this time... And I'd been sent over from America to England for special research. I was to come back on board the Nautilus myself. And so, of course, the very first day at sea, I was called into the captain's cabin. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Hale. Won't you come in? Thank you, Captain Shaw. Uh, sit down, sir. Thank you. I, uh, I called you into my cabin to talk to you about Philip Nolan. You no doubt know he's on board with us this trip. Yes, I've been told. He's an old friend of yours, I believe. Well, yes, we were in the Western Legion together. You know the story. Are they still maintaining silence, Captain? I'm afraid so. And as long as you're on board my boat, I must ask you to please never mention the United States to Nolan. No news of home, no talk about old times, no word of his family, and especially no word of the United States. Well, of course, sir. Whatever you say. And, uh, Mr. Hale, be prepared for a shock when you see Nolan. He's changed. He's changed a lot more than you realize. Changed. Yes, the captain warned me, but I wasn't prepared for what I saw. Nolan was an old man. An old man 
at 32. He was standing with a guard at the railing of the Nautilus when I approached him. He wheeled around and stared at me for a moment. Hail! Hail, old boy! It's, it's good to see you. I, I didn't know. I had no idea. Philip, hello. It's been a long time. Oh, it's all right, guard. You can leave me alone with Hale. I won't escape. But, sir... I'll take full responsibility for him. Of course, sir. I'll report to the captain. Hale, look at me. I'm still your old friend, am I not? Of course, Philip. Where have you been? What have you done since I last saw you? I, uh... I traveled around. Been in England. England? What happened after you left the Western Legion? Well, I, uh... I... You... You what? Oh, tell me, Hale. I... I've read a lot of good books. Books? <laughs> That's just great. You too, Hale. I can't help it, Philip. Have you any idea what I'm going through? From boat to boat, always being shifted. Always under guard. Every book I read is carefully edited. Whole passages are torn out of it. I never eat dinner at one table. I'm shifted around all the time. Nobody can stand my company night after night. I've so little to talk about. And I'm... I'm so hungry for home. So hungry for news of home. My family, my country. I want to touch the ground, the land. I want to know what happened to Texas. What did they do to Aaron Burr? Hale, ten years of this. Ten years. I was just a boy. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know. Please, Philip, please. I'm sorry, Hale. Seeing you again. And you're the only person who knows I feel this way. I won't mention it again. I know you won't, Philip. Don't tell anybody. You, you won't tell anybody. Well, of course I won't. Four o'clock. I have a little duty to perform at four. Well, what's that, Philip? I read to them, the sailors. They like it. The only thing I'm allowed to do for them. They pick the book and I read a chapter or so. Well, that sounds interesting. You mind if I come along? <laughs> Not at all. Well, we'll go down this hatch over here. Follow me. This way. This way to the cruise quarters. Hi, everybody. Hi, 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 Hello, man. This is Lieutenant Hale. Hello. Hey, glad How do you do, sir? I hope you don't mind if I just sit here and listen. Ah, oh, glad to have you. Here. Oh, what book have you picked out for today? Well, you started The Lay of the Last Minstrel yesterday. Let's finish that. Yeah, good idea. Finish, Where is it? Here it is, sir. I've never heard of it. Oh, it's a good poem. I was on the third canto yesterday. Yeah, let's see. Oh, yes. I'll start here. The aged harper, how so ear, his only friend, his harp, was dear. Like not to hear it ranked so high above his flowing poesy. Less liked he still that scornful jeer. Misprized the land he loved so dear. High was the sound, as thus again the bard resumed his minstrel strain. Read more, Mr. Plain. Yeah, 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 has, uh, has anybody got a glass of water for me? My voice is sort of going. Oh, sure, sure. Here you are, Mr. Nolan. I'll pour it for you. Thanks, sir. Ah, that's better. Now, oh, the next verse. Quiet, everybody. Go ahead, Mr. Norman. Breathes there a man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land, whose heart ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned, from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go, mark him well. For him no minstrel raptures swell. High though his titles, proud his name, boundless his wealth, as wish can claim. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch, Concerted all in sir. I'm sorry, boys. I don't think I feel up to reading. 
out, eh? That's the way it was on board ship. Little things like that poem were always occurring. And poor Nolan tried to take it all like a man. He stayed below in his cabin for two days after that. And I didn't want to intrude myself on his misery. So I spent my time talking to the captain and the crew. It was late the second afternoon. Captain Shaw, myself, and Lieutenant Vaughan were standing at the rail. And of course the conversation turned to Nolan. Vaughan was saying... Funny thing about Nolan, he never allows anybody to come into his cabin. I wonder why. That's his business. I don't think we should intrude, Lieutenant. Well, sir, it was just curiosity. Hear what the men say about that cabin. And what do they say? Oh, some think it's full of voodoo tricks or some such nonsense. You know, Captain, if I were you, I'd order him to leave his cabin door open. Since I'm the captain, Mr. Vaughan, that decision is in my hands. Ship sided off port, slaver! Uh, pardon me, gentlemen. Ship sided off Lieutenant Vaughan. Yes, sir. To your post, sir. We'll be pulling alongside the ship to border. Yes, of course, sir. Ship sided off port. Slaver. Ship sided off port. Slaver. The ship suddenly came to life. We had overhauled a dirty little schooner which had slaves on board. We fired two shots across her bow, and the little ship struck her colors. A boat and officer were sent to board her. There was considerable commotion on the slaver, and we waited patiently. Nolan came on deck, and was standing at the rail, talking to the captain, when Lieutenant Vaughan returned to report to the captain. Captain, sir, yes. I can't understand them. Every man on board speaks some strange patois, though some of them can speak Portuguese. Portuguese, eh? Nobody on board here speaks Portuguese. I do, sir. I've learned to do many things in the ten years of spare time I've had. You know them, eh? Well, uh, would you oblige by acting as interpreter? Of course, sir. As well as I can. Thank you. Mr. Vaughan. Yes, sir. Have your men remove the handcuffs and the ankle irons from those men enslaved in that boat. Very well, sir. Uh, come along, then, Nolan. Lower second lifeboat, bosun. This way, Mr. Nolan. The boat was lowered, and we rowed over to the slaver. We stalled in the waters for half an hour, giving Vaughan plenty of time to quell any manner of resistance. By the time we boarded the boat, the three-man crew was in chains... And the slaves, freed from their handcuffs and ankle irons, were swarming over the deck, wildly jubilant, shouting. But the deck was dirty, and the stench from the ship was strong. And the three-man crew, chained to the mainmast, were shouting dire oaths at us as we boarded the side. Gracias a Dios! Estaremos en casa dentro de poco tiempo! Ask those men which is their captain. Yes, sir. Come here, su capitão! Aquel ali! He's the tall man with the red hair, sir. Ask him if he knew that he was violating the law of the United... Ask him if he knew that he was violating the law, Mr. Nolan. Sabia que estado violando a leyes dos Estados Unidos de América. No say. No say nada. Says he knows nothing, sir. Nothing, eh? The rotten scoundrel. Look at the filth of this deck. Look at the way he had the slaves handcuffed. He knew. He knew what he was doing all right. He was dealing in human flesh. Tell the slaves, Nolan, they're free. Quietos todos! O Capitão Shaw, do barco Nautilus, que que lhes diga que estão todos livres! Livres! And uh, you can also tell them that their captain will be hanged as soon as I can find enough rope to hang him with. O Capitão! O Capitão Shaw diz que a tripulação será punida! Tell them, tell them I'll take them to Cape Palmas. O Capitão Shaw diz que vocês serão levados ao Cabo das Palmas. Não, 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 não. What are they saying? They're all shouting at once. Wait till I single one of them out. Buse, sing Buse. Venha cá, silencio todos. Que dizem estes homens? Não queremos ir ao Cabo das Palmas. 
Queremos ir para a casa da nossa gente, voltar as nossas mulheres e filhos. Cabo das Palmas está muito longe, longe de casa. Meus companheiros estão doentes. Ia no meu barco à procura de um doutor. Estes diabos me capturaram. No, uh, meu povo morirá no, uh, se não... Me levaram contra mim de vontade. Quero ir para casa, para me olhar. Oh, 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 they want to go home to their country, to their children, to their wives. Oh. First man wants his kinfolk. And the second man, he says his people are sick. Very sick, and that he left his home to get a doctor, and that these devils kidnapped him. He wants to go home. Home, Captain. Every man wants to go home. Yes, of course, Nolan. Tell them yes. Tell them that they can go to the mountain of the moon if they want to. If I have to sail this schooner through the great white desert, they shall go home. Oh, Capitão Shaw! This school voltará todos para casa! And so the slavers were returned to their homes. And they never forgot the look in the eyes of Nolan, the man who would help them. The rest of that journey was uneventful. When I left the Nautilus in the harbor of New York, I saw Nolan standing on the deck waving to me and shouting. And that was the last I ever saw of Philip Nolan. The very last. But I heard tale after tale of the courageous and self-sacrificing work that he did on board each and every ship he sailed on. And then this morning, I received a letter. A letter after 40 years have passed. A letter from Lieutenant Vaughan. Only he isn't a lieutenant now. He's a captain of his own ship. I opened the letter and started to read. Dear Mr. Hale, Philip Nolan died this morning. He never allowed anybody in his stateroom, as you know, until late last night. It was exactly four bills. I got a message from Nolan to come down to see him. I walked into the cabin, looked about for the first time. Do you know what that cabin contained? A shrine to America. A large American flag. A picture of Washington... A large bronze eagle, a map of the United States which he had drawn from memory. And Nolan lay on his bed, beckoning me to come closer to him. Vaughn. Vaughn, I, I know I'm dying. But you see, I have a country. Vaughn, I've had a country with me all these years. In my heart, Vaughn, I'm dying. Surely you can tell me something now. Please. Just something. Of course, Philip. Anything you want. The map. Tell me what belongs on my map. Is the Mississippi Territory still the Mississippi Territory? No, it's a state now, Nolan. Mississippi, Missouri. Yes, yes, I've guessed that Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. Ohio was the last I knew. That makes 20 states in all. There are 34 now. Where are the other 14? You haven't cut up any of the old ones, I hope. But they're not cut up. You're all pretty in the new 14 on your map for you. Uh, Florida. Imagine Florida, state. Iowa, Illinois, Louisiana. What about Texas? What happened to Texas, Vaughn? Texas is part of the Union. Wonderful. Wonderful. And Arkansas. There's a good American name for you. Did you hear me say it, Walt? American. 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 <laughs> American. I said it, Walt. On this whole ship. In the whole of America. There's not a better American than myself. Not one better in the world. Is there, Walt? Not a better one anywhere, Philip. You're a real American. Thank you. Thank you. And his last wish was to have a gravestone somewhere in the United States. Do you think you can arrange for that gravestone, Hale? The letter was signed, Sincerely yours, Richard Vaughan, Captain, United States Navy. 
And in a churchyard in his own United States, there is a gravestone in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the Army of the United States. He loved his country as no other man loved her, but no man deserved less at her hand. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought to you the story, The Man Without a Country. Bellkeeper, hold the bell. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio